Good afternoon from Scotland. Well, at least from my side. <laughs> no. Welcome to another exciting episode of Lore Beards. And today's going to be a super fun one because we're going through a character that I think rocks and is relatively little talked about in Warhammer circles for all it popped up into the Total War. And we'll almost certainly be discussing why that's the case as we progress. Yeah, so uh, this one is really exciting. There's actually a lot of very interesting ideas uh, for Galrach that we'll be delving into as we get up and running. Uh, but uh, thank you all for so much for being here for today. We're very excited to get it real back into this uh, after uh, last week was <laughs> a lot of good craziness. Sorry, I just read Hammond's comment that came in and it made me laugh. <laughs> oh, well, Hammond. Do continue as you, as you started. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to mention something uh, concerning that before we go properly live, because I'm Scottish, as you may have noted from my lovely little introduction, and I don't pronounce Galrouch in the same way that everybody else does. I literally can't help myself. Every time I read it, I pronounce it differently. I'm fully aware that it's definitely a ch sound because it was written by English people for an English-speaking audience. But nevertheless, for me, it has it was and always will be Galrauch. Um, Galrauch to me sounds like a proper chaos dragon. The alternative sounds like someone who's in the huff in the corner. Galrauch. <laughs> he's in a big. He's in a big Oscar the Grouch in the corner. Oh, I'm Galrauch, and I'm not happy that I'm a chaos dragon. I wish I wasn't a chaos <laughs> dragon. <laughs> So for me, it's Gal Rauch, <laughs> although for this stream, I will say Gal Rauch because I'm fully aware that's how the vast majority of people out there pronounce I, it. But be aware, it for, me, <laughs> for me, it will always be Gal Rauch. And if you, uh, Gal Rauch should ever pop up in Lawhammer, it will be Gal Rauch, not Gal Rauch, because screw pronouncing it with a ch, because I don't <laughs> want to have Gal the Grouch in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see, for it, we all know that Galrach's uh, dominance in the bass fishing fishing <laughs> world is largely due to careful meal planning by his personal nutritionist, Krimlo. But does he drive an electric vehicle or a hybrid? Wow, that got into <clears throat> some hefty <laughs> these specific <clears throat> details. On that, there. and before we go bizarrely um, into electric vehicles. Um, I was with a taxi driver just yesterday. Here we go, tiny little anecdote time. And he had a hybrid taxi. And I was like, oh, hybrid taxi, super cool. This is nice. It was running smooth as you like, super quiet. And I said, oh, yeah, this is really good. And he's like, yeah, I don't use the hybrid part. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, it, it only runs for 50 miles. And then I have to convert it over to petrol because it's not the most efficient engine. And I said, so why don't you use the hybrid part, you know, for the first 50 miles? Can't be bothered. <laughs> Why do you even get it then? Oh my Why God. did you bother in the first place? Um, but the reason he, uh, as it slowly but surely unwound through the course of the conversation, the reason he got it was purely so that people, when they pressed on the app, would go, I want the hybrid version. Oh, what a dick. Feeling, feeling like they were doing something for the environment. What an absolute... Yeah, what an absolute... Oh. So many words come to mind. Yeah. Um, let's just say, rude? not a good guy. It's a bit rude. So there we go. <laughs> let's hope that Gal Rauch isn't that rude. Turns out, probably a bit ruder. Probably a bit, though. Yeah, there is probably. there is a lot of a lot of sad stuff that'll come up. There uh, is indeed. So uh, before we really get up and running, um, just to take care of a couple of quick uh, little tidbits here and there, uh, there will not be a vote. For the next lore beers this week because y'all were super tied uh very very split between grombergle and galrach uh pretty much the entirety of the time they were literally tied until i think like the last day and a half where galrach eked ahead by one percent so because it was super duper close and we're feeling nice this week uh we are going to do grombergle as well so grombergle will be yeah. this upcoming sunday uh but today we're going to do galrach because he managed to squeak ahead by one point uh towards the end so let me, uh, also, let me also add, it's not just that they were so close, because we've had several that were close before in the past, like, for example, Vampire Lords and Durthu. Um, and where do the vampires come from? It's because the votes for both of them were so freaking high, massive, all the way up deep into the 40 percent throughout um, the entire vote for the entire time. So, yeah, um, so many of you voted for both of them. It felt almost felt unfair not to allow good old Grombrindle to pop up, too. 
Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and then last couple little things. Uh, there will be an announcement soon relating to Dark Deeds uh, coming mm -hmm. up in the very near future for those of y'all that have been following along with that, uh, which, of course, is the board game made by good old Mr. Law and some buddies of his from back Mark in the Mark Gibbons days. and Andy Chambers. And you see their names sitting on the front there. Look, Andy Chambers, Mark Gibbons. <laughs> so that is going to be super exciting. That will be going up for pre-order in the very near future, which is a really good very way to near. support uh, through a little bit of a side stream, support what we do here on Lorebeard. So that's really great. And yeah, uh, lots of other, uh, I don't, if you haven't already, you can also check out, we did do a reaction stream this past Wednesday to all the stuff mm. DW did, which had definitely some ups and downs, uh, but uh, we had a hoot. So uh, there, it, it was a good time. And uh, without further ado, we're just going to catch up on these last couple super chats and then we will hop into it. Uh, also, just because I saw already somebody asking about it in the chat, Queek is very, very close, or at least part one. Uh, I mean, all three parts are going to come out probably within a week of one another. Um, but part one, which is the big part that everyone gets the most hyped about because it's the, the history portion, is extremely close um, to the point I even pulled up like a second editor to help us get through some stuff faster. Uh, but uh, I am very, very excited for that project finishing, and I hope you're all looking forward to it. Uh, well, might I just say as well to that, congrats for getting it almost done. I mean, it's, it's been, a, it's been <laughs> some time coming. Yeah, you, you can you can congratulate me when it's done done. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's get across the finish line. Uh, hey, man, what's Hashit's favorite Lakota chief, Sitting Bull? Ha, 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 ha. Oh, you could have <laughs> saved that for a Chaos Dwarf one at the very least. <laughs> No, he's got he's got to use it now, or he's gonna forget. Though I like the idea that Hammond just has like a giant series of boards with like <laughs> thematic things, and he just writes down anything he can think of as he thinks of them. Um, all right, so let's hop into today's lore bears, where we're going to be talking about Galrach, the first of the Chaos Dragons, also known as the the Great Drake, and the father of the Chaos Dragons. So this story uh, is kind of interesting because we're going to be hopping around some pretty huge gaps in time. Yeah. Um, being kind of one of the primordial characters of Warhammer Fantasy, this is one of those characters that can sleep for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. But miss some? No, I didn't. Wait, did I miss a super chat thing? Oh, oh he did the same joke twice, but answered it with a different answer. Go ahead. Oh, what is Galrach's favorite Lakota chief? Gaul, and then Hashit's favorite Sitting Bull. Uh, okay, that makes more sense. Now I understand where how it's one still, came to the other. Yeah, it's still for grown that, worthy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I so, guess it works a little more. Also, it's um worth noting it's something we were discussing before we began. Um, Galrach is one of those characters that almost popped out out of nowhere. Um, hmm. and. For me, the very first time that I spotted the character was back in White Dwarf. Um, and this is this is going ooh, 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 back through the mists of time. So White Dwarf, well, it must be around about 270-ish area. So about 274, 275, somewhere around there. Um, and they were doing as they often did, particularly during the 6th edition and every other edition before and after, using White Dwarf as one gigantic advert um, where they dropped in all the goodies for the upcoming armies, or sometimes for the army list they just released, uh, giving everybody a taster of all the cool stuff that was to come. And this great two-headed monstrosity was dropped in that white dwarf. I think it's 274. Thanks. 274? I'm going to say 274. Um, and it was dropped in there, and it was given a big write-up. Um, and I uh, first read that back in the day, and two things immediately hit me. And I think that they stand all the way through to the later version that we get of the character as well. And that is, when you read it, you go, holy shit balls! Gal Rauch is freaking amazing! Look at what he's done! How the... Oh, he must be big! He must be special! Then you read his rules, and you go, oh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Okay, accurate. I mean... Fair enough. I mean, yeah, he's got weapon skill sex. Yeah, sure. He's got toughness sex. Oh, that's not that much. I mean, he's basically a bunch of sexes. Well, what's yeah. going on here? Um, and I, I, I was so stunned that I went back and I read through the, the background bits again, which included some pretty cool shit that we're going to get into as we go through the course of this. 
And then I went back to his rules again and went, yeah, he's pretty good. And on the battlefield, he's really good. In particular, on the wizard side, rare for a big monster to be given an enormous chunk of magic. But stat-wise, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, he was fine. And I think this stands as a perfect example of what often happens in Games Workshop's lore, where they massively overhype a character. They make this character so extraordinary that when you read it, you're like, oh, hell yeah, here we go. We're going to get something amazing. I realize a basic Dark Elf assassin would not just give it problems, may very well kill it. And you're just left at the end going, well, that's not what I expected. He's fine stat-wise, but his background is, as we will discuss, not only pretty goddamn epic in terms of some of the things that he's done, but also pretty freaking sad. Yeah. Sad! Uh, so, it is, like Andy said, it is worth noting, uh, so Galrach um, is a character that quite literally just popped into existence, uh, where if you go back and read the older Chaos Lore, like back into 4th and 5th edition, you had the really, really big book of the Champions of Chaos, which was kind of the big book that introduced a lot of the characters that everybody knows and loves to this very day, uh, where you got like Archaon and a bunch of other characters like really well, deeply um, looked at and spelled out and everything and all their items and stats and all this crazy stuff. Uh, he's not in that book. Um, there is no, there's uh, the big dragon character is Egrim von Horseman because he rides on Baldros. Um Though hilariously, there is a uh, there was actually an author that made a mistake with Egram in one of the army books where he accidentally said that Egram was riding on Galrach for a while, and then him and Galrach broke up, and then he got with Baldros. <laughs> yeah, and we got ourselves an even um, a another mistake through there too as well. When um, Baldros is definitely not a descendant of Galrach, but it is mentioned in other places that all the two headed dragons almost certainly come from him. You do love how the various writers accidentally conflict with each other. But in this instance, it wasn't that bad because the writer that made the contradiction um, kind of didn't because they did it in character in that it was a scholar that was investigating it all and it was done for the role-play game side of things. And I think this is where the lore is at its strongest when they have a scholar or they have somebody else giving an in-character opinion and they can say, I believe it is these things. And then when you look at the extended lore, which they may not have looked at, you find out that it contradicts. But it doesn't matter because it's just that scholar in game's opinion giving a potential version of what the actual lore is rather than grounding it with a firm god voice. A voice that says, all chaos dragons with two heads come from Galrauch, the father of dragons, and that's it. That is often the way that Games Workshop writes. And in this case, on the roleplay side, they did it right. And even though a contradiction was made, it was a contradiction that didn't actually cause the lore to go snap. Um, as you would go, wait a minute, it says one story here, one story there. They contradict and both are written with the God voice. Um, this was, I think, a fine way of breaking the lore. Yes, and uh, we'll get into the whole like Father of Chaos Dragons aspect because it's actually more nuanced than a lot of people realize it is. It's not... It's not as like black and white of a statement as it may appear to be, because they do use some wording that leaves some pretty fun gaps. Um, but without further ado, let's actually dive into this. So to talk about Galrach, we got to wind the clock way back. Uh, to get technical, we actually have to go back even before Chaos, debatably even before the old ones. So back, way back, way, 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 way back, uh, we've talked about in other streams how the dragons were agreed in most sources to be the primordial masters of the planet. Uh, while there, of course, were already many different species of dragons, where you have the more eastern dragons, like the Celestial Dragon Emperor, uh, who at this point was just a big dragon. He was neither emperor nor celestial at this point, really. Uh, and then you also had uh, the likes of uh, Calgalanos the Black, who's running around, uh, who is believed by some sources to be the father of western dragons, but not necessarily the Ulthuan dragons. And then for the Ulthwani dragons, they had, um, uh, I think it's Draugnir, because in, in Draugnir, Draugnir is Anarian's, in Draugnir, and I think yeah. Anarian's dragon's dad is supposed to be Draugnir, who's like the big daddy, uh, so who very well could be the, you know, the big father of the, or at least the oldest dragon we know of, of the Ulthwani dragons. But anyway, um, so... Way back during this time, uh, by the time the old ones show up, they raise Ulthuan from the depths of the sea, and dragons start to move onto the island of Ulthuan, where they begin to meet with the elves, they begin to build relationships with the elves. The two biggest, baddest dragons we know of from this entire age. So this isn't 
So this is including literally the most powerful dragons we know of, period, that actually show up in the flesh are in Draugnir, who is the dragon of Anarian, who mm -hmm. is big, epic, and beautiful and awesome. And then his uh, fellow, uh, some sources claim he's a sibling, but it's not concrete whether they're directly related or whether it's more of the, just their kin uh, in the sense that they're both dragons. But the second one is Galrach, uh, which Galrach at this age is known as the Gold Drake because he is a beautiful, colossal golden dragon. Yeah, and I think um, th the only real source that claims that uh, Indraugnir and Galrach are siblings does it in the loosest way. Mm -hmm. It's duplicated in a couple of places. It's in White Dwarf. It's in the army list. And generally they say, and you can tell by those great gleaming, glittering scales upon the dragon's back, Galrach in this case, that he was almost certainly a brother of the uh, absolutely extraordinary um, <clears throat> in Dragnir. And you're just left going, why write it like that? That's a really, really obscure way of just saying he's not just the sibling of in Dragnir. Um, and I, I, every time I read it, I'm just left with a little bit of, what were you doing there, Gav? Because this bit, this entire section and the army list that connected to it was um, written by Gav to the point that I'm actually considering messaging him just to see if he had anything <laughs> going on. Because I speak to Gav most weeks, one way or another. So Gav thought was clearly, um, he had something in mind here. Maybe he was just not wanting to confirm that in Dragnir had a sibling, unless that accidentally contradicted some earlier lore. And rather than look it up, he just wrote it vague. Maybe he just decided to go vague. But what we can say for certain is that probably they are siblings, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are. But to reinforce an absolutely glorious dragon. The model that we ended up getting for Warhammer was pretty small. I mean, it was only about... So yeah, big. which was a limitation of the times. Which yeah. was a limitation of the times. And I think also when you look at the Total War Especially example... Especially like, metal. Like, yeah, <laughs> a proper metal pretty. dragon. It's old. It's back, all the way back in sixth head. Um, and later versions of it, particularly digital ones as well, I still don't necessarily really think dialed down on the majesty of what this dragon could represent in the same way that the game never really bothers dialing down on the true majesty of what say the biggest dragon ogres could offer because they're mm. daft they're so much bigger than everything else but i will say that when you look at the deeds of what gal rauch is going to be doing through the course of it's almost unfair to call it he anymore but he is um his life over the course of time he is not just a little dragon he, he does stuff that's just, quite frankly, you say what now? Yeah. How? <laughs> Particularly when you look at the stats. So I think this is somewhere where I'm going to deeply diverge from my preference, which is often looking at stats and looking at models and figuring out what Games Workshop doing them and saying, ditch it. Ditch the stats. Ditch the model. They do not in any way represent what Galrauch is. Galrauch is one of the very first dragons and is a proper freaking huge one. We're talking at least as big as any of the biggest dragons get. And as we will note as we go through, is extraordinarily powerful. Yeah, this is a dragon that if you were to compare him to the modern day star dragons. So we're talking the star dragons. Like they're the yeah. biggest eldest ones that go toe to toe with greater demons. He dwarfs them. Like he is bigger than them. He's stronger than them. He's much older than them. He mm -hmm. is colossal because he... Uh, what's interesting is the in the original 6th edition story, he's very specifically not mentioned to be related to a Dragnir, but a later author who I think picked it up in 7th edition introduced the family dynamic. He, he, no, he's mentioned all the way back in White Dwarf um, before the book. Oh, uh, it's probably it's in the there. White Dwarf article. Yeah, it's originally yeah. from the White Dwarf. The White Dwarf article, um, white uh, where they describe Galrauch for the first time, is much longer than the entry that was put inside the army list. And it includes mm. quite a few extra details. Um, and they clearly got cut down so they could fit the one-page spreads that they yeah. used for the army list. So more be the background was written, it was dropped in White Dwarf, and then that White Dwarf became a source for other authors later yeah so uh just like you would expect with in Draugnir, this is a dragon who was strong enough that he probably very likely encountered some of the old ones was able to have conversations with them because we know they spoke to some of the early dragons and he was allowed to live on old one which if you think about it for more than a couple seconds is pretty fucking huge because the old ones had curated this perfect paradise for the elves and were watching over it at least from a distance 
um, to the yeah. point that some of the Slon had been there, and they, had, you know, Lord Croak taught some of the early ancestors the elves how to use magic and yada yada. But the dragons were allowed to move in and live there and form these really intricate relationships with the elves. And I think that this is um, a part of the lore that is often uh, skirted around because no author has really dived into it. But we can make some pretty clear observations here. We know that the dragons did not like the old ones, or at least some of them. But the very fact that these ones are here on Ulthuin suggests that there was definitely not just one or two factions, but multiple factions, including a faction of dragons that wove into the great plan as it was before the coming of chaos. Because they were on Ulthuin, they were with the elves, they were quite intimate in terms of their relationships that they had. Um, they're almost certainly in this pre cataclysmic time at least at the point where the concept of an elf riding a dragon or indeed even potential actual bonding relationships were in place and this was something that would come to the fore as the wars come later we have ourselves we have ourselves dragons that are basically a part of the great plan of ulthuin which means they're not separate they're not warring with the old ones and the old ones are using their various lizard men spreading across the world in these pre-cataclysmic times are not trying to kill these dragons. These dragons are on side, which means we have got ourselves sympathizers, which is, I think, a super fascinating way to view them. Mm. These have, um, they viewed the colonists arriving, the great old ones coming in and changing the world entirely. And they've gone, you know what? I'm on your side. I'm not on their side. And that is pretty huge, particularly because not a single author has ever picked up what is the obvious conclusion of what Ulthuin presents when you look at that in comparison to the background the Lizardmen have and the background of the dragons in other parts of the world, where they are pretty much universally on the other side. So I, you can immediately see that the dragons of Ulthuin are almost certainly not on good terms with the other dragons. Yeah, so Galrach the Gold uh, sets up shop in Ulthuan for a while, and we don't, of course, have a lot of details about what is really going on in Ulthuan in the pre-Cataclysm times. So mm -hmm. we're pretty much good at this point to fast forward to the Cataclysm. Where Cataclysm! Everybody's favorite part, uh, where uh, both of the polar gates collapse and explode and chaos comes screaming into existence and shit is on fire for a good couple, uh, almost two millennia. Uh, just bad, bad everywhere. And so before we uh, detail what happens there, let's jump on our super chat. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Let's uh, get those bloop. discussed. Uh, Have you said anything interesting? Here we go. Uh, yeah, has chat said anything interesting? Uh, I wasn't expecting. Uh, thank oh, you so much for the super chat. <laughs> he never says that. What a, what a unique thing that he doesn't do every week. <laughs> and I like how he's basically been performing a rain dance to summon Tarmacon. Every week in lore period. And it, it almost feels like it might work. It almost, yeah, it almost feels like it might come to fruition soon. What do you call a clumsy dragon? A flaming oaf. <laughs> I feel like that would somehow be a dwarf joke that probably actually has another layer to yes. it. Oh, CP4N. Oh. Andy's memory. Page. CP4N, you kick ass for confirming that. Uh, there's some things that go out of my memory. One of the reasons that I recall this so clearly is because I was once um, going to be writing a book on the Phoenix Kings um, for Black Library. And I was halfway through the pitching process. I'd written out the entire breakdown for how it was going to work. And Galrauch was one of the cartridges. Galrauch, pardon me, was one of the cartridges I was going to be using because there ain't no way. I was going to have such an integral character to the formation of the elves not come back and lay waste to something during the course of a Phoenix King book. It was a complete waste of uh, potential not to do so. So I read up literally everything that was there on the cartridge, which turned out to be relatively little at that point, and gathered it together to use as a resource for what I was doing next. And for some reason, much like White Dwarf number 127 always sticks in my head because of its inclusion for the first time of the Aspect Warriors for the Elder. And you got to see all Jez Goodwin's astonishingly good artwork for that. Hmm. White Dwarf number 274 sticks at the back of my head largely because it had Galrach and it had details that weren't anywhere else. So it just sort of stuck there. So thanks for confirming that. I feel like my memory's not entirely shot. There you go. Uh, Penting Jesus. Hey. 
<laughs> Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, first time Super Chat, long time Grumble Beard. If we're talking about OG Dragons, will we ever hear what little we know about Skullix the Great and how he lost to Mortken? We we can talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, she uh, and then she, the Warpstone Dragon, is one of my personal favorites. Uh, mm. the, the warp, big old nasty Warpstone Dragon from the Monsters Arcanum book. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Who is actually a really interesting character. Um, we can speak about other dragons more towards the end. Um. But uh, yeah, we we should have time for that by the end. Uh, Madatus Callum, what do you call Galrach's spawn? Drong <laughs> nil. Good old Kozalin. Kozalin is a Kozalin is a language that I think is best spoken by yelling. I don't know why. It just <laughs> it just feels appropriate. <laughs> um, cheers for all the entertainment. Thank you, Harry. We appreciate it. What's Galrach's favorite show? Dragon Ball Rip. Dragon Ball GT. It's not Dragon Ball. It's Dragon Ball GT. Well known. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes, indeed. Rip to the creator. Uh, hell of a guy. Yeah, uh, the six Mister Famir looking at the donut dragons splitters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the laughing guys. They're an example in the deep lore of a kind of ur dragon. Uh, yeah, we talked about them actually a little bit at the beginning, where you have like Halgalanos, Thraugnir, and of yeah. course the uh, Shen Zhang, who is the uh, Shen Yang, who is the celestial dragon emperor. Those, all three of those are like ur dragons, so the fathers of dragons. I, I think there's almost certainly a gap in the lore that Games Workshop will at some point either A, fill, or B, forget about. And by forget about, I doubt that will happen, given that they're now putting at least some more stress on Cathay and the fact that there are dragon stories to tell. And by attempting to tell those dragon stories, you can't help but look backwards because their genesis is way back before the cataclysm. So I think it's something Games Workshop might at some point detail further, but as it stands, exactly what so takes. Yeah, and I yeah, I would agree with Andy, especially as um, I believe for the old world roadmap they put out, I think the High Elves are getting paired with the Warriors of Chaos as far as like releases go. So there's a very good chance Galrach might be the returning mini for Chaos because it's a very iconic mini and I'm sure they'd be happy to re-release it. In which case you might actually see him be playable in the old world again. Mm -hmm. um, Derek, love the shows. Billy Bretonians, first Thanks, minis Derek. ever while listening, thinking about how to paint them. Mixed heraldry or single lord colors. I always think it has to be mixed heraldry. Mix, I, mix, mix. Yeah, I understand that you can do single lord now and they're kind of trying to encourage that, but that's just not Bretonia to me. Um, yeah, me neither. I, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm old school when it comes to Bretonia. I've I must have painted some of the region around about four, five, six, seven thousand of the bloody things. Um, and even having done all that, if I was doing another one, which I'm attempting to avoid, but if I was doing <laughs> another one, I would definitely be doing it with mixed heraldry, just because <laughs> it also breaks up the boredom. Because if you're painting lots of them, um, sometimes you can get a little bit. Oh, not another bloody blue and green guy. Oh no, let it stop. Yeah, so it allows you to turn it on, and you can like play around with lots of different patterns and stuff too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so uh, one of the things that's uh, I think interesting to talk about really quick involving the dragons of Ulthuan because Galrach plays very heavily into what's about to happen with this is there's a concept among the elves of Ulthuan that different authors have tried to tackle, and so talking about it is a little tricky, even though it's really critical to the lore, uh, because of how different authors have interpreted it, which is something known as the dragon song. Um, so for those unaware, there is Kalidor the wizard, but his full title is Kalidor Dragon Tamer. Uh, and he is considered, of course, one of the most powerful wizards to have ever lived in the Warhammer Fantasy world. Certainly the most powerful non slon non-demon character, just period, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to magic. But the reason he's called Dragon Tamer is because according to a lot of the notes that we have about him, he invented a form of magic known as the Dragon Song. Now, what the Dragon Song exactly is and does changes wildly from author to yeah. author. Um, some authors have interpreted the Dragon Song as Kalidor invented a form of magic that allows the elves to communicate with the dragons uh, mm -hmm. so that they're able to talk pretty much psychically. And the song can be used to awaken them from the deep slumbers that nothing else can. Um, and it allows them to interact. There are other authors who have ran with the idea that while it's now used for that, it was originally designed to dominate the dragons by force. So it used magic to clamp down on their brains and make them obey the elves, which a different, uh, which was very heavily pushed on during the War of Vengeance trilogy, which a later author would also use in the Burn the Bounty Hunter series. 
yeah. which is actually really fun because that dragon that shows up in that series actually shows up in Brunner as well as kind of like a big bad towards the yeah. end. But uh, but that but when they introduce that concept, the High Elves very strongly suggest during the War of Vengeance that that's not how you're supposed to use it because the elves came to understand the dragons were very you know thinking extremely intelligent emotional creatures and they viewed dominating them as kind of a horrible sin but they can by using the dragon song so the so, dragon, well, uh, no, so, no no I, i'm so i'm gonna let andy kind of run with his thoughts on the dragon song because there's a lot of different avenues it can take and it also implies a very interesting history between the elves and the dragons yeah um i was attempting to avoid that part because it's messy um, but I think I think it's not just messy; it's freaking cool. Um, and I think that there is definitely a very clear story that the high elves are at least pitching. But you've got to remember that the elves that first put together this were not high elves; they were elves. Yeah, elves. They elves, yeah. predated high elf and dark elf as a concept. Now, would a dark elf be happy to dominate a dragon or indeed anything else? The answer to that is clearly yes. And also remember that these dark elves are just Nagarai's elves. <laughs> Do not think of them as somehow separate and weird and different. This is what the elves of Nagarai were like. The great depredations of the dark elves to the north in Nagaroth and how weird and different they are to the high elves is massively over-egged. They're not so different. So the idea that there are ancient magics that used to dominate other creatures is, for me, not just likely, it makes sense for the overall character of the elves as yeah. a whole. Now, could that magic also be used to be a bit more gentle, to communicate, to communicate pardon me, and to befriend and be bestest pals with your nice dragony bud? I think the answer is quite clearly also yes. But I think that if you're looking for the genesis of that particular tale, it seems most likely that we're looking at someone like Lord Croat coming along and saying, hey, elves, here's some help. Yeah. And what's interesting is you can also kind of extrapolate this because we don't you don't get a lot of details um, like finer details. It's not very vague about what exactly led to a lot of the splitting between Anarian and Kalidor, where Kalidor got so fed up with Anarian that he left. The court and went south with all the Caledorians and were like, we're not going to talk to you guys anymore. One of the ideas you could run with if you're trying to explore that concept, which would be very interesting, is if Anarian and the Nagarinthian elves, especially after the death of a Dragnir and everything, were using concepts like the Dragon Song to dominate powerful creatures as they were starting to kind of uh, uh, deal with, or sorry, not the death of a dragon. This was before the death of a dragon. Here. But uh, if some of the Nagarith, uh, Nagarith elves were looking to dominate other creatures and dominate some of the dragons because they're saying, we need these creatures. We need things that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these powerful demons. We need all the dragons we can get, even if the dragons don't necessarily want to help. Whereas you could see the Kaladorian saying, no, we have to use the dragon song in this particular way. I like doing the opposite. Uh, yeah, and you could flip it. You could absolutely yeah, flip it because definitely, uh, which would work actually very, very well. Because a, it plays on your expectations, and b, we know in Dragnir was very fond of an Aryan. Yeah, in Dragnir and Anarian are like that, and I think in Dragnir's influence upon an Aryan would almost certainly have led him in a very different direction. Um, and I really like that as a potential outcome to the story. So yes, and I would probably flip it, but it was me. Right yeah, and that would explain how Kalidor could field so many of the actual dragon princes. Oh yeah. Dragons. The dragon princes come from Kalidor and there should be a good reason for that. And that would provide one. But on top of that as well, we, we get quite a lot of Kalidor's character when he's told don't do this. He goes and does it anyway. This guy is a very self-determined prince. He is not going to listen to others if he thinks it's wrong. He's going to do what he thinks needs to be done, regardless of the consequences. The consequences for the Great Vortex are arguably the end of the world, should it ever collapse. That is how bad the Vortex is. And he basically goes, I'm going to make the Vortex anyway, because damn our tomorrow, I'll save today. And that is the choice that he makes. And Arian isn't just against that, as we know from the stories, he is completely against it he believes he can win but he's only one elf wandering around the world kicking ass and chewing gum while the rest of it burns so yeah there's lots of cool stories here but the more antagonism that you can create between anarian and kalador i think back then the
the better the overall story. Yep. So, anywho, uh, Galrach. So Back we. Do. The, the thing that we do know uh, that I really, really like about his original interpretation, this got kind of lost in later editions because they kept shortening how much text he was allowed to have. <laughs> um, so there were part, parts that they, they got rid of. They, they didn't like retcon it. They just don't mention yeah, it because they, they don't ran out of space. Uh, so in the original text, uh, Galrach, just like in Dragnir, had a writer. Um, and his writer is an elf prince by the name of Learfin. Um, yeah. We know very little about him. Uh, we just know that Learfin was a mighty warrior. He was a great prince in his own right, and he was one of Anarian's contemporaries, and that he fought upon Galrach's back, and the two of them were borderline unstoppable. Yeah, um, um, we, we get... The only real detail we get is that Learfin was leading the elven hosts in the same way that good old Anarian was yeah, doing. Yeah, he led the, so, the, eastern, the eastern flank. Absolutely. So this is not some minor elf. This is someone who could end up being um, an Aryan in his own right. Um, this is a proper kick-ass elf who is riding on one of the biggest, nastiest dragons that exist out there. Yeah, and Galrach is specifically mentioned to be the caliber of dragon where he is used to smite the big, ugly greater demons. Yeah, Like, he would literally fly above the battlefields breathing his legendary golden flame to just obliterate entire regiments of demons at a time and he would fall from the sky like a thunderbolt to rip apart greater demons and this is in an age where there's so much magic in the world that the greater demons not only had more variants than we may see today but they also tended to be larger like they were huge creatures uh that were magic monstrously difficult the world yeah yeah um so for demons to properly exist in the material plane, there has to be an extraordinary abundance of magic. That's to begin with. And at this point, it's not just extraordinary, it's hyper-extraordinary because the vortex doesn't exist yet. The very worst cataclysm has recently occurred and the world is so saturated with magic that demons can exist anywhere. They can pop up out of nothingness literally anywhere. And this is not a good time to be a defender of Althuin, which of course yeah, no. good old Gal Rauch has to deal with and the demons were often enormous and it's also worth saying a couple of sources um, make it relatively clear that at least at the beginning of the war those demons were also significantly less, let's say, allied to one of the four chaos gods that mm -hmm. happened through the course of the war as many of the greatest demons that formed effectively fell into either the Aegis of one of the Chaos Gods, or the Chaos Gods themselves plucked them, or the Chaos Gods, through some other method, started to, let's say, reshape the demons. There are many different potential stories you could tell, and I'm avoiding one of the most obvious ones because it's not one I prefer. Um, so we are <laughs> left with an enormous section, uh, enormous demons, and some of the dragons were big enough that they were taking on one, two, three or more of these at once. As we all know, Indraugnir takes on four, one for each of the Chaos Powers, by himself. And this is the sort of wars that Galrauch was dealing with. Enormous demons, and he was effectively the greater demon hunter, and a very effective one at that. But Chaos saw this. So Chaos came up with a plan. Yeah, so... Uh, to set the stage for what's about to happen, you need to keep in mind that Galrach and Learfin have been together for over a thousand years at this point. Yeah, um, They have been fighting side by side with Learfin riding on his back uh, all throughout the Cataclysm, which has lasted for like 1400 years or whatever at this point. And it has been brutal fighting. And just like with Anarian and Draugnir, Learfin and Galrach are like brothers. They are exceptionally close. Mm -hmm. and this all builds up, builds up, builds up until we get the battle at the Isle of the Dead. So Kalidor has initiated the Vortex, and amidst all of this insanity, the Chaos Gods and all the demons realize what Kalidor's trying to do and go, oh shit, and they send everything. They throw the kitchen sink at Ulthuan in an attempt to stop him. And of course, Kalidor would have been completely overwhelmed if Anarian had not chosen to gather up all of the forces of Ulthuan and hold the line against the demons for as long as possible. Um, which to show just how obscenely powerful this demonic invasion is, is that had Kalidor not finished the spell when he did, they would have lost because Anarian, like he basically gets killed in this fight. Anarian, who is a double God, God dragon writer. <laughs> 
<laughs> like three tiers of godhood still gets dealt mortal blows during this confrontation. But during the fight, Galrach and Lirfin are instructed by an Aryan to lead the east flank. So they are one of like the big, big, big generals in this big fight. And they go up against the coordinator of the demonic legions, who in the original story is unnamed, but they named him in later editions is a greater demon of Zinch known as Fate Claw. Fate Claw. And <laughs> I hate that name so yeah, much. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not even a oh, name. Uh, man. Yeah, presumably, maybe he probably has a longer name, but nobody bothered to ask him for it. Uh, but he's known as Fake Claw. It's probably the better mm -hmm. way to put it. So Fake Claw is the coordinator of the Demonic Legions, but is said to be a unstoppable sorcerer. The elves, like, because, especially because all the best wizards of the elves are busy with the Vortex spell, nobody's really able to stop him. And he's, like, obliterating entire regiments and is just kind of this absolutely horrible force. He sees Galrach in the air. And you have to remember when you're dealing with a Lord of Change, as powerful and as large as Fate Claw is, that this is a demon that has been scheming and prepping and doing a lot of tying together little strands of fate to lead to this moment. And he initiates his plan where he unleashes a horrific blast of magic that doesn't hit Galrach, but it hits Lirfin and kills him. And Galrach, in that moment, loses his closest companion. Someone that he's been with for millennia at this point, if not longer, because we don't know how long before that the two of them had actually met. And Galrach loses his shit because his best friend just died. Yeah, um, and if you want to go down the darker route, as in suggesting that the dragons had been tamed with magic, the route that they would do so is pretty well known because um, elves have been using magic to control etheric entities and other creatures for millennia. They do so through a familiar bond. And a familiar bond creates a bond between the spellcaster and the animal. Now, this is a pretty well-detailed thing on roleplay and in other parts where familiars are basically directly attached, almost so linked through to the creature, that, pardon me, the spellcaster that has put them in place effectively. And if either party dies, it completely breaks the other side. So if you lose your familiar, part of your soul has just gone wink um, and you can't cope for quite a long time. You collapse your grief is overwhelming it is extraordinary so if you're looking to justify what came about you could even claim that the very spells that were used to try and keep galrauk in place were the thing that ultimately caused this to happen and as we all know zinch is the lord of magic this will have been set up before probably the cataclysm even began after all, Zinch is the god of fate. Zinch sees all possibilities, and Zinch makes plans accordingly to pick the possibility at once. This was a charted outcome. If you want, think of the Zinch like one of the great old ones with the great plan. They Not entirely different, but you could argue that mm. Zinch didn't like what the great plan was, so came up with an alternative. And Gal Rauch, in this particular place, no matter which version you go with, the outcome is the same. On one side, we have Gal Rauch, who is effectively a slave to a spell. And if that is the case, the, the breaking of that breaks him completely. His will drops enormously. He's in extraordinary grief. In terms of the rules for Warhammer, that means that the monster goes into monster rage. Yeah, as monster's rage. Yeah. Monster's rampage time as it just randomly starts killing everything around it. So that's basically what happens on the rules side. But in terms of its psychology, utterly broken, which is kind of what the greater demon wants. Or alternatively, on the other side, we just have two incredibly close old friends who have been living with each other forever. They're basically the equivalent of lovers. This is not just a, 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 a pal who has died. This is someone that they have been intimate with for centuries and has finally died. And the grief overwhelms the poor dragon. The grief is so strong that its will, which would normally be so exceedingly high that no demon, no matter how powerful it was, could ever come close to influencing it. But in this moment of grief, it is suddenly and arguably fatally, given where it eventually ends, um, weakened to the point that this demon 
which is not a material entity, even though it is about to get carved up because of what just <laughs> happened by Gowrouch. And when I say carved up, I mean, stop, head, tear, rah! Um, that will not stop the demon. Indeed, the demon is about to do something which is, in the greater scheme of things, extraordinary. Because we have a creature that is effectively immune to everything. It's a freaking dragon. It cannot be got, except it's about to be got. Yep. So Galrach uh, descends down on this Lord of Change. And it's worth noting, like Andy said, that Galrach does not act wisely here. He's lost to rage and grief. It even goes out to say, Galrach doesn't care if he dies. Like, mm. he throws all caution to the wind, and he dives into the middle of the demon host to go after Fate Claw, which, from a strategic standpoint, should have almost guaranteed his death. But it didn't. Because ah, Fate Claw he's doesn't, def yeah, Fate Claw <laughs> doesn't defend himself. Nope. He literally just holds open his arms and he smiles and waits. And Garrosh comes down on top of him, bites his head off, and just rips and just obliterates his physical form. Just tears him to pieces. But Fate Claw's body doesn't do what it's supposed to do when demons die, which is normally that they kind of like just melt away into nothingness instead his body Although, dissolves. this is the time of chaos so it's very likely they left bodies at this point oh that's yeah that's actually very yeah hard. um so this is a time where there's so much magic in the uh realm of the material realm that the demons don't just get sucked back to the realm of chaos quite the opposite when they die they die leaving mortal components behind um and that in many respects will be used later by various dodgy wizards who are looking mm -hmm. for various demon parts you need that uh, when you have a, a point where magic is so saturated in the world demon parts can continue so normally if a greater demon were to fall in this magic saturated environment its corpse would land a corpse by the way is a part of your soul it that part of its soul mm -hmm. would continue to exist for some time as the remainder part went back to the realm of chaos but that does not happen oh no yeah, so Fake Claw's body dissolves into mist, and it all oh, coalesces. Colors. It all mm. coalesces around Galrach, and then just gets sucked up into him, like it goes in between all of his scales, and it's absorbed entirely into his body. Um, Galrach does not seem to notice this at first. Um, like he literally, it describes the story. He flies up into the air mm. and screams triumphantly into the skies that he kills this demon. And then he stops. And at and this point, um, uh, down on the battlefield, the elves are cheering because they know they've won the day. Now, admittedly, they have lost something horrendous in the fate that their lord has died. But the greater demon that's leading the opposing forces is down. The elves are triumphant. Galrach is triumphant. But... Yeah, so Galrach freezes. And then he starts to basically just vibrate very very horribly like having a seizure essentially and his body becomes rocked with mutation where the way it's described is that parts of his flesh well the first thing that happens is that his eyes change so his eyes turn into a different color and he immediately turns his head and starts breathing fire on the elves but it's not normal fire that comes out of his mouth it's multicolored flames. So, and what's interesting is it's not scribed in the normal zinch colors. It's not just pink and purple. It's pink, purple, green, red, orange, black, white. Like it is this horrific, unseen before level of power coming out of Garrosh's mouth. And something we've talked about a lot about elves is that elves physically are very, very, very hard to mutate. But Galrach's flame is so intense that he doesn't burn anything. Instead, anyone hit by it, just, just their bodies are just completely overcome by mutation. And they're literally turned into like the thing from the movie, The Thing, where they just have bits and bobs and all sorts of other horrible shit exploding out of their bodies. And he's doing this to elves, of all things. 
Yeah, and and uh, it seems to have um uh, an almost continuation effect in that as this great gouting, mutating flame comes out, the scales of the dragon literally flow and also begin to mutate. Eyes and mouth start blistering and popping and coming out from the side as sighs and songs and chants to the great changer of ways starts rippling down the length of this great worm. It is not a good time to be on the elf side. And then just when it looks like it couldn't get any worse, the thing literally bursts out with tentacles and two, not one, two heads form as the first head splits in two like a flower and bursts into two long ne necks from the single neck and the second head, half a head on each side, manifests on both sides and they don't entirely look happy with each other. Yeah, so... Uh, it's worth noting, like Andy said, that Galrach has undergone a horrific change. If you ever look yeah. at his model, you go, why is he called the Gold Drake if he's all like red and blue and black? And it's because the mutation quite literally, granted, there are some scales on his model that should be gold, but most of his body, what you're seeing is his literal exposed muscle because his his flesh runs off of him or wow. runs da strips down his flesh and if you actually go look at his tabletop mini um, in detail, it's hard to see because of how old it. they weren't able to get as much detail as they would have liked back then. Mm -hmm. But he literally has tentacles and spikes and all sorts of other just nasty, gribbly bits coming off of him. Mm -hmm. And there's a super iconic piece of 6th edition artwork that's quite Oh, away. I love it. It's what I've yeah. got on my screen right now. <laughs> yeah, and I think shows it off better than any other piece of art because you can see how horrible he looks. Yeah, he's been torn apart at the neck as these two heads have formed. And there's tentacles writhing out, there's eyes, there's mouth, there's just big spikes and claws sticking out. It's also fair to say that the two heads aren't entirely equal. One of them is clearly, clearly much more dragon-like, although it has quite a lot of extra spikes on top of its normal spikiness. But the other one is almost, but not quite, almost bird-like. And there's obviously a reason for that. Yeah, so uh, what happens at this point is actually probably my favorite part of the story because it's the part of the story you wouldn't necessarily expect if you're aware of the good old demonic possession stories, which is that normally the way these stories go down is that at this point, uh, Fate Claw has obviously possessed Galrach, and uh, in 99.99999% of Chaos stories, Galrach would simply be a big nasty champion of Chaos for the rest of time. That's not what happens. Instead, as Fate Claw is triumphant in that he has possessed the body of one of the most powerful dragons that is around, something unexpected happens, which is that the more draconic of the two heads turns to the more horrible fleshy head and starts to attack it. And Fate Claw realizes he does not have full control of this body because the actual original spirit of Galrach is not dead and refuses to die to the point that the body, not only this head, but like one of the limbs, like Galrach starts tearing his own body apart. Oh, yeah. He's trying <laughs> to kill himself. Yeah, totally. I've just posted a, um, a quick uh, crop of that image um, over in my Discord channel if anyone wants to go have a quick look at the original sixth head piece of art. It is super lovely. Um, so I've just popped a link up there for anyone who wants to go have a look at it. Um, so for all what we have now is quite clearly a greater demon of Zinch, Fate Claw, who has, <laughs> I'm not going to not laugh at that name, I apologize. Um, Fate Claw has managed to seep his way out and get into the dragon. That dragon is not fully underneath its control. Now, normally, if you get yourself possessed by a greater demon, and there have been rules for this written in the game in more than one place, um, your body is doomed. You will die in a matter of moments unless you are, for some reason, particularly resistant to mutation or chaos, where you might last minutes. You do not survive the possession of a greater demon. That just doesn't work in the Warhammer world because of the amount of magic that's around it. It sucks into you and it all goes super wrong. The greater demon does not fit inside a mortal housing well. But dragons are special. This dragon is not going down. But that equally means that this dragon is not going down. Its consciousness, the original consciousness of that dragon, is in there at all times and constantly bickers with and fights with Fate Claw, who is currently inside his mind. 
it's also worth noting that as the vortex goes up and it all goes a bit wrong, Galrauch is now in a completely different position. Magic suddenly sucks from the world, and Galrauch does what all the dragons pretty much do the second that happens. He fucks off. <laughs> <laughs> he goes for a nap um, because it's it's sleepy time. Um, now, as is uh, mentioned in more than one places, although it's contradicted in others, so take this with a certain amount of salt. Um, dragons are uh, require um, magic to be at their most weightfulness. Now, the magic can come in multiple forms. It doesn't just mean the world has to be saturated with it. It could be in the form of consuming lots of souls. It could be in the form of lots of magic getting summoned and channeled in its direction or something. But the biggest dragons sleep most of the time as they gather in the winds of magic to them that are sleeping in. And as the world slowly but surely resaturates with magic and the chaos gates wax again, most of the dragons will at least probably wake up, which is one of the reasons why in the end times, all the dragons and all the great creatures and monsters that often sleep wake up again because it's the end times. And each time the end times, or at least the potential end times come around, all the great dragons wake up. It's worth also noting, this is contradicted in a few places. And this is going to be, for Galrauch, part of its cycle. It will sleep a lot, wake up at times, have loads of kids, do all manner of horrendous stuff, and then go back to sleep again for long periods of time. And we don't have a lot of detail for everything that Galrauch does. But for the few things that he does do, we have quite a lot of detail. And some of it is really rather nasty, impacting other species in a variety of different ways. But we can say for certain that if we use Gulrouch as a potential predictor for when great events of the end of the times are, we also get an extra couple of dates for when one of the Ever Chosens may have woken up. Because we have a couple of dates for when Galrauch wakes up that mm. are not attached to anything. And you could say, well, maybe that's when one of the great um, attempts to, for the Ever Chosen to destroy the world have come about. Because as we know, Archeon was just one of multiple attempts to end the world. It's just Arche Archeon the 13th. Isn't it always the 13th? Oh, blood. <laughs> oh, Archeon the 13th. He's ever totally chosen. not a saving plant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, uh, is the one who is successful. All previous ever chosens kind of flubbed it. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that we're about to cover. But where would you like to go first, Mr. Sotek? Uh, the, the first thing I want to do before we actually get caught up on some super chats and stuff is that uh, for those curious of the way the Ulthuan cycle kind of ends, is there is uh, kind of a uh, epic, but if you think about it in a comedic sense, almost hilarious moment where when the, like Andy said, the vortex is finished because Galrach, uh, the greater demon likely hoped to use Galrach as kind of the ultimate bludgeon to win the war for the demons, but then of course he couldn't actually overpower Galrach, which yeah. caught him off guard and the two of them were too busy fighting to actually contribute any more meaningfully to the big final battle. So when the vortex goes off and all the demons fade away into nothing, Galrach is literally the only thing left that is not chaos associated because he has enough physicality to him that, of course, he doesn't fade away. He's just there. So he has to flee because the dragons and the elves are, uh, he knows they're going to try and kill him. Uh, because by this point, the greater demon, the Lord of Change, has retaken control of the body. He manages to get it under control and he flies away to the east where he goes to the old world uh, to set up shop for a long time. And now we're going to get caught up on Super Chat goodness. <clears throat> yeah. Here we go. Uh, what have you got to say? Oh, let's yeah. see. oh, no, no. I already did this one, Derek. But yeah, I hope you're having fun with your. Uh, there uh, was um, there. there was a Twitch one right after that, as I recall. Oh, there. You know yeah, what? Just, you I've, got it, it. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh cheer uh thank you morton crescent between galrach the changeling the blue scribes and Hellbrass, what is it about zinch that inspired so many iconic char chaos characters Ooh, uh, right so my answer for that is not necessarily going to be the best one and that's that the writers themselves have got a better grasp for how to use zinch to inspire cool characters and often that's because one of the core concepts of zinch is chaos and change and one of the core concepts of chaos is that because they took an uplifted for ding, ding, ding from Michael Moorcock. Um, and for any author who has read those books, they immediately have very strong ideas for how to express it. Where when you look at the other options are 
slanesh's our nurgles and our corns um often because they've got less already in their library they have to create something new and often what they create on first stab is not necessarily the best but whatever they created on first stab became the thing and that thing is now there and then the next writer comes along and looks back they basically just repeat it because you'll find that through the generations of warhammer the great creative period was really between third and fifth after that, it's reiterative, adding yeah. occasionally a new idea. Gal Rauch is brilliant because Gal Rauch is one of the rare examples where a new idea was actually completely added to the system. This was a completely new character that was dropped in, ripping, referencing, pardon me, other characters in the past, but not necessarily replicating them. So for me, uh, the best answer for this one is that people understood the concept of chaos through Zinch better than they necessarily understood how to make the other ones super freaking cool. And that la landed upon a lot of attempts to make super freaking cool characters for the other chaos gods, rather than looking at what came before, taking the best bits and combining them into something new. So basically, they had more experience. Yeah, I also think there's a thing where because Zinch is kind of considered the preeminent magic god, um, there's a lot of really easy things you could do with like, oh, I'm going to create a sorcerer that has kind of a funny gimmick, or I'm going to create a warrior mm. that has a funny gimmick, or I'm going to create a hybrid that has a funny gimmick. Like, there's just a lot of space to play with. Whereas if you're dealing with corn, you're not supposed to be able to use any wizards. Uh, and then if you're dealing with Slanesh or Nurgle, um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the writers that tackled those characters just didn't have the imagination to really delve into what those could be. And they kind of just ended up retreading the same ground over and over and over again. I mean, um, most of the Nurgle characters are basically Lothar Bubonicus from the original Realm of Chaos books, rejigged one way or another. And it's left feeling a little bit, really? Can't you come up with something new? And when you look at the Zinch characters, they often kind of did. Each one was unique and interesting in its own way, which kind of wasn't necessarily the case for the others. Not that I don't like some of those other characters. Don't in any way suggest that. I'm a big fan of some of them. In fact, I'm hoping that we cover some of them soon because there's some that I really enjoy. But um, they are often the individual character amongst the rest that stands out as being great rather than the whole selection of them being all interesting in their own right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would very much agree with that. Yeah. Uh, then we've got Necromancer Cobalt. How do y'all, how do mutations work for mm -hmm. dragons? If most, if not all chaos dragons have two heads, are there any examples with more heads or weird limbs or are they more or less uniform? So this is something we're about to get into with Galrach, yeah. uh, because they actually do some really fun extrapolating here. Um, it's note that despite the fact they're using a God voice, they very heavily avoid using like, uh, very strict language. But the as far as how do mutations work, they're mutations. They could work any way you could possibly imagine. Uh, dragons, because they're so big, if they are mutating, they can sustain a lot of mutations before it starts to really affect them in a meaningful way. Because um, there's, it's not a cardinal rule, but a lot of the times, the bigger you are, the more mutations you can kind of handle before it starts to become a genuine problem. But uh, don't get the idea one of the mistakes that the tabletop game can infect people with is people will look at the tabletop game and go oh all chaos dragons are two-headed dragons no 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 that's not true um the the ones in the tabletop game were but that's because they made the galrach mini and were like use this um, <laughs> uh, so yeah. they, therefore they were all two-headed dragons uh because they didn't want to make any more or baldros. yeah or baldros yeah or baldros. so it, it was kind of an issue of they had a many to work with so all of the writing for the tabletop game had to reflect that many yeah um, I, i'm going to go further though um necromancer cobalt and also thanks for the chat um and say that dragons are by their nature different to other species and they are more resistant so um you'll find that for all dragons can obviously be affected by mutation particularly if they're possessed by a bloody greater demon of zinch the vast majority of them will be effectively immune but those that have fallen to chaos will express in one way or another however they are clearly not immune but equally 
all of the models generally don't show much in the way of mutation. And from that, you can extrapolate that the dragons themselves, even those who have fallen, are much more resistant to the, let's say, physical mutation than they are perhaps to the maddening mutation that you can get of the mind. So you'll find that if one were making rules for them, you would probably use similar rules to what halflings use inside the role-playing game, which is that 90% of mutations they get are mental in that chaos sends them mad in one way or another and not just simply they're insane in a classical sense and they've got mental health issues quite different they have literal <laughs> mutations of the mind which means that their soul itself has mutated into something different and their mind no longer works in a way that other people's minds do but they only get 10 percent of any mutations that they receive as physical ones and the dragons are almost certainly the same because that loosely is not just supported by the models, it's also supported by the general lore. It takes something special to get a proper fucked up mutated dragon. In this case, we've got a, something super, super special. It's a greater demon of Zinch inside that dragon. And still somehow the dragon continues on because its very corpus is much more resistant to chaos. Indeed, its mind is as well as we find out because this dragon does not go down easily. Yeah. And uh, just as like some kind of uh, ideas for your to answer your thing, if you look at two of the really, really famous big bad, uh, what you would probably consider to be chaos dragons being Skullix the Great from the invasion of Lord Mortkin or uh, Skalak the Skull Host, who is a big bad chaos <laughs> dragon of corn, they don't have any mutations yeah. at all. Like they had official minis with zero mutations, um, even though they are like big big powerful chaos dragons yeah so um we're looking at them being in a similar place to elves um but not the same because they definitely do mutate um although that mutation could be and I, you could make an argument for this if you wish that all the two-headed dragons broadly have come from well our two-headed dragon here as he yep. has sired dragon after dragon after dragon so thus they don't mutate really at all but the fact that they're carrying the blood of also a greater demon means that they may mutate in one way or another beyond that you're going to need a super special reason for where these mutations come from because all of the fallen miniatures we have either bear pretty much the same mutation or almost nothing else Corn Cobb, hey guys, here's thanks for all the free hours of entertainment you give us all. Oh, we appreciate it. Hey, that. and thank you so much for the super chat. Enormously appreciated. Yeah, Nils can't watch live today, sadly. Uh, we'll watch mm. later. Just want to say thanks to the stream, guys. Well, we appreciate it, Nils. Hopefully, you enjoy the stream later. Indeed. Um, uh, the one guy you know, Garrach, is in two minds about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Hendrick, how common is possession in Warhammer? Seems less common in the 40k. Anything symbolic like Galv or back in Warhammer? Uh, I will say it is way more common than people think it is just because it doesn't get focused on a lot for the tabletop game but if you delve into any of the role play games it is all over the goddamn place yeah it's, it's all over the place in the books um you'll find that if you look at say for example the tome of corruption it's got an entire section inside it for possession in warhammer and um, the tome of corruption is a warhammer fantasy role play second edition book and it dives into it pretty well and it shows that possession kills the hosts um, it's uh, because the Warhammer world is much more magically saturated than, say, 40k is, much more magically saturated. And those magic, those winds of magic get sucked into those who are possessed. You find that mutation happens swiftly and collapse of the mortal form tends to happen swiftly. So for a uh, an example of a long term possession, you need either something special like Gal Rauch, who is. I think no one can deny special um, yeah. or alternatively, you need a um, a, a different type of demon that could do it because demons come in all different types of forms or alternatively mm. a weaker demon that has managed to slip in and in some respects that's how plague bearers are often created when you get exposed to Nurgle's rot and things grow within you until eventually you become a demon yourself there's some aspects of that there possibly or lastly we have ourselves a special magic ritual or something that is <laughs> unique that allows something to come to pass or a magic artifact that actually carries the possessor and whoever carries the artifact kind of becomes possessed through it but it's the artifact that takes the damage so there are lots of ways around it and the various novels that exist out there have done it in many ways in one example was uh, a demon that was a tattoo so the tattoo took all the damage and if the tattoo was on you you effectively became possessed by that demon until the tattoo left out but it was wrapped up in a magical spell a curse 
that meant that the demon, uh, when a certain thing ha happened, had to leave the host that it had possessed. So the magic and the twirliness of the winds of magic were wrapped up in the tattoo and the spells, not in the person being possessed. So normally, possession kills. But there are so many loopholes, you're as well to say possession kills sometimes. Yeah, and like just off the top of my head, you have like Malice Darkblade, obviously is yeah. basically possessed by Zarkan, and he's a super famous character. Uh, artifact. You, yes, artifact situation. Uh, <laughs> yep. You also have the situation of the Anointed among the mm -hmm. Dark Elves of the Cults of Pleasure, who are Dark Elves that took demons of Slanesh into themselves and became... Oh, oh that's contradicted in other places, and there's no demon at all. And they yeah. are the demon. Uh, I, I'll that. say... In the yeah. in the Storm of Chaos army book, it's just dark elves yeah. that have allowed uh, demonettes into their souls and made them much more powerful. Uh, and they managed to find some kind of symbiosis, which is terrifying. Uh, mm -hmm. But it also notes they've been around for like a fucking crazy long time. Like no new ones have been made in millennia. Um, yeah, these are like the same. And yeah. then you have other situations. Uh, another good example is the Incubi and the Succubi, which were created by the demon prince Samael. Um, where those demons realize, which if you've been watching your Lawhammer, you may go, wait, I know that name. Um, <laughs> what? But, uh, yeah. Um, but if you're, uh, but those are a case where demons used a very particular form of ritual to create mortal bodies that were empty, and the demon then basically meshed themselves into the body. But Samael warned them that there was a downside, which is that if they died, they died. Period. Forever. Yeah. Um, which they did not listen to the warning. Um, but you know, supposedly they're still around, some of them. Yeah, super fun. Uh still loading. Oh yes, uh Gull Roach. Uh good <laughs> uh, uh good tidings, gentlemen. Uh Gull Roach thinks uh seconds best amalgamation characters in and around Warhammer. We know the first being that looks like Kremlo, so I'm moving on. Uh <laughs> still loading, thank you. And that is, uh, rules are why I almost decided on my Coronate Chaos Dragon having two heads and one decapitated neck, mm -hmm. similar to Placidusax in Elden Ring, but it felt a little too nurgly. I mean, the idea that, like, a dragon would have sacrificed one of its skulls or lost one of its skulls to corn, which could mean why it's lost a head, I don't think that's too I think that's at all. super fitting, um, Mandatus. Definitely not too nurgly. I like the idea of him having sacrificed, perhaps in a battle where he didn't do well enough, did not um, spill enough blood for Corn to be happy, sacrifices one of his own heads. That's kind of freaking cool. Yep, Jonathan Scott, is there anything both heads actually agree on? We'll talk about that in a second. Like, I'm sure they would <laughs> disagree on how to cook him, but they would probably both want to eat Balthazar Gelt. Uh, so... Let's actually talk about Galrach post Cataclysm incident where he becomes mm -hmm. the Galrach mm -hmm. we all know and love. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Galrach, although we'll talk more about specific things that happened in his history, I think it's worth diving into who he is as a character now, um, which is that for the most part, the vast nine times out of 10 that you would see Galrach or encounter him, in which case you're probably about to die, um, the demon is in full control. Um, yeah. The Lord of Change has a very strong stranglehold over the body of Galrach, but there are times and certain events that have occurred where the original Gold Drake will be able to wrest back control of one of his heads, in which case he virtually always immediately starts attacking his own body, um, which is kind of a horrific thing to think about because it implies that Galrach is borderline always aware um, mm -hmm. even if he's not aware, he wakes up for brief moments of lucidity and the only thing that he's ever trying to do is kill himself. Yeah. And, uh, as we mentioned, uh, near the beginning of this uh, stream, it's a pretty sad tale for poor old Gal Roach because Gal Roach, in a moment of absolute horror, is taken over and suffers pretty much eternally since that point, almost certainly regretting all of his life decisions. Poor mm. old dragon. And yeah, I think it's fair to say that we have a dragon here that is uh, entirely conscious, sitting behind the scenes, watching its own body be used in ways that it does not want to see it be used. And the only time that the demon... Um, is able to lose control is when the demon itself is potentially stressed or out of it in some fashion. For example, when Galrauch wakes up, the great long slumber of the dragons and magic is waxing in the world again, there tends to be a moment when they just do not get on and they tear into each other as um, they struggle for control. And what once control is established by the demon again, it tends to be pretty consistent until, again, perhaps they're in close combat or Perhaps they're in a situation where their life is threatened and Gal Roach 
suddenly makes an attack and tries to take over. It happens rarely, but it happens enough that there's enough scales of these heads wobbling and the dragon tearing into itself that have popped up in an almost legendary fashion. Although, let's be honest, most of the legends of Gal Rauch are, holy shit, he's killed everything. Yeah, so uh, speaking about uh, what Gal Rauch is actually like, because like we said, the Lord of Change, uh, how it has adapted to life as a dragon is in control most of the time. So it's worth noting, the Lord of Change inside of Gal Rauch has made Gal Rauch one of the most horrifically powerful Zinch sorcerers in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not just a dragon. This is a dragon with all of the knowledge and magical power of a greater demon who was leading the strategies and magical focus of the army that took on Anarian. I'm going to add another detail as well. One of the horniest dragons, um, and I don't just mean he's <laughs> covered in spikes, um, no. in that um, as he goes through his periods of wakefulness, he has multiple children and the vast majority of the chaos dragons if not necessarily all that exist have probably come from gal Rauch. and i pity to think whoever gal Rauch's partners may or may not be for those particular let's say chaosy dragon horrors that are born afterwards but the dragons that come out afterwards um they appear to be relatively consistent they are not covered in all of the horrendous mutations that literally and flicked Gal Rauch. He's got mouths and tentacles and all sorts of horrors on his underbelly that are just disgusting. Most of the Chaos Dragons that we are aware of come out like dragons, but typically with two heads. Again, showing that the influence of the greater demon and Gal Rauch, effectively the two heads yeah, that rule they it, do, yeah, pass they, on. It's worth noting that one of the nasty things is that Gal Rauch's blood seems to have a very nasty effect on his descendants. Um, and that, like Andy said, they have the twin heads, but they also tend to have problems that you could kind of describe to being due to the demon blood, which is that a lot of them, their innards are on their outards, so to speak. Um, like they have literally exposed organs or muscle that's on the outside with the scales on the inside. Like their bodies are twisted. They're not constantly mutating. They seem stable, but just the process of being born almost seems to imply that like they're almost just being they're mutants. yeah they're mutants in yeah. a, kind of a nightmarish yeah. way um, yeah and, and they're foul creatures like yeah wide. and i think it's also fair to say that you might not even consider them to be chaos dragons in the greater sense of things in that them i reckon the vast majority are not so much worshiping chaos and being ridden oh, by yeah. chaos warriors so. and then they are just maddened dragons that tend to terrorize local communities. Um, and they are not good by any stretch of the imagination. And a lot of the terrible tales of the worst dragons have probably come from the various get of good old Galrauch. Um, in that Galrauch's kids, and as another nice fact about good old Galrauch, he's been everywhere in the world. Um, there's nice clear bits where he says he's been in Nagaroth, he's been in Ulthuin, he has been down to Lustria, he's been to Cathay, he's been over the seas multiple times when he goes through one of his wakeful periods, meaning that his get will be everywhere that there is dragons. And I would not like to be, as I said, on the receiving end of however the hell he got those eggs into place in the first place and fertilize them. It does not sound good. But as we said, as a loose point, he is one of the hornier dragons out there. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting is that Galrach, uh, they actually very explicitly mention he does not only sire children through blood, but also through magic, where Galrach has used his sorcery either on other dragons or just other creatures to forcefully mutate them into forms that he finds more pleasing or forms that serve some grander purpose. There's actually a really cool tidbit that I don't believe is strictly canon by any means of the imagination, but it kind of opens the idea of how old and powerful this character is, where in, I think, the 6th edition story, the character, which 6th edition was really fun because most of the stories are not told from a god perspective, they're told from, like, yeah. a character perspective, and the perspective suggests that there are people that believe that Galrach created the Chimera. Like, yeah. the actual creature we know as Chimeras, their origin is Galrach in that he took other creatures and forcefully mutated them and created a new species. So I think that um, this is where we take a, just a brief pause and go, seriously, does that seem at all likely? And I think the answer is yes. 
This is not a dragon as we understand it. This is an extraordinarily powerful greater demon of Zinch that is held within the corpus of a dragon and can fulfill Zinch, the changer of the ways, plan upon the material realm. Part of its plan is to weaken all of the great nations, of all the great, let's say, realms of the world. And it does so through its many children that it has created through a variety of different means that terrorize and break down civilization. Galrauch is effectively a greater demon of Zinch that is made material. There are very, very few of those. Potentially Gal Rauch or maybe one or two others that have been popping popping up the lore here or there. And most of them are under such constraints that they're held in an artifact or they're underneath a spell or a curse or whatever else it might be because they're so insanely dangerous that anyone that becomes aware of them tried to stop them. Gal Rauch is under a completely different curse and that's that he's a dragon and he needs to sleep. And his long periods of uh, hibernation last for centuries, meaning that his wakeful periods are relatively short and don't last that long. Meaning that whatever plans that Gal Rauch, as the greater demon, Fake Claw, has for the world, they have to happen in a relatively short period of time, perhaps a decade. So that decade is used, and trust me, that dragon is not just sitting there wandering around going, and attacking with armies or anything similar as it blows away various bad guys. It, it, it's got plans, you got and schemes. a lot of those plans yeah. and schemes are going to look exceedingly undragon like and a lot of those plans and schemes are going to come across like, well, strangely enough, a greater demon of Zinch, and that shouldn't be forgotten. Gal Rauch is unique. Yeah, and I mean, just think about that as well for a moment of just the idea that kind of the ultimate a goal for a, any greater demon or just demons in general is the ability to be able to permanently manifest within the mortal plane. This Lord you of Change move. accomplished that. Yep. And, like, and you can see why it, it, its mouth twisted with glee when the dragon bit into it, which would normally be the end of its schemes. Indeed, this was the beginning of its schemes. Yeah. So as far as just kind of less, uh, so he's created a lot of different creatures throughout the world. So it's not just mm -hmm. dragons, um, but chimeras and and it, like it even mentions many other twisted monsters that haunt the world yeah. or creations of Al Raj. Um, and it's worth noting that when you're even looking at other split headed chaos dragons, that some may be direct descendants and some may be creations. Creations. Yeah. Yeah. Like Absolutely. if we look at Baldros, Baldros, Baldros actually leans more. If you're looking at what Baldros is comes off much more as a creation of Galrach as opposed to a son because Great. Baldros is weird. Um, yeah. Like, he's canonically indestructible, which is bonkers. Um, to the point that that's why he got sealed away beneath the Colleges of Magic. They couldn't kill him. Yeah. Baldros feels, uh, has always felt to me like he was a creation of Galrach. It, it, it just fits. It makes sense, particularly given the very nature of the character at hand and the nature of the entity that would be required to create something like Baldros. We have an answer, so why, why make it something that isn't obvious? Clearly, this is what this Chaos Dragon does in the world. It creates exceedingly nasty powerful creatures like Bodros, like Chimera, like various other things as well, to disrupt, to break up, to ensure that Zinch's great master plan comes to fruition in the way that it's meant to do so. Yep. And uh, so yeah, super fucking nasty. Uh, we're mm. going to take a brief break now to catch up on Super Chats, and then we're going to mm -hmm. talk about some of the actual things, things that he did. did. Um, uh, things which did. is a surprisingly nasty list. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So we start here. Uh, Fenton Jesus, thank you again for the super chat. We really appreciate the support. How many yeah, female thanks. dragons are still kicking, more accurately sleeping around the old world? And did any encounter slash survive meeting good old Galrach? Uh, there are probably quite a few. Um, like we don't know what the likelihood of male to female is. It's probably about 50 50 ish of male to female dragons running around the world. Um, there's actually some pretty hilarious indications that most people of every species would not be able to tell the difference between male yeah. and female dragons. They don't express extreme sexual dimorphism, so you probably wouldn't be able to tell. Um, and as far as how many Matt Galrach, probably quite a few. Uh, because yeah, he um, has a ton of kids. Yeah, um, it's very possible Galrach um, it, it's very possible Galrach is an it. 
um, in yeah, that it's very, very capable of laying its own eggs. It's very capable of laying its own fertilized eggs. It's very possible there are no terrorized dragons out there, and they're just Gal Rouch's magically born, crazy twisted kids in a variety of different ways. It's also worth noting that, particularly with lizards, there's a uh, and some other species, but uh, there is a strong indication that they can change gender, well, sexes, pardon me, um, if required by the circumstances they're in. That could be the case for dragons. Perhaps uh, attaching some form of external sex to a dragon is broadly a mistake anyway, um, beyond how they may wish to present themselves. They're all going to be deep-throated weirdos, after all. So um, how many are there? We can't say for certain, because Warhammer never really properly answers that question, although the dragons definitely are male or female at certain points. It doesn't mean that they couldn't potentially switch. It doesn't mean that good old Galrauch requires Nature's anything fear, other. <laughs> yeah, totally. And trying to make everything have exactly the same, uh, let's say, sexual traits as what we have in the real world is ultimately futile. Creating new cool shit is always worthwhile having a look at, at least. So yeah. in this particular case, I'd say probably a lot more than you first think because a lot of dragons sleep and are never discovered. Um, and how many survived the encounter? Very likely, possibly none. They might have just had the eggs laid and the whole process ended up with a very dead dragon. But I do think mm -hmm. that having some form of traumatized dragon would be certainly something you could do, but it would be a pretty difficult subject to ta handle with any sensitivity. Yeah, and there there are a lot of different dragons. I mean, there are dragons out there that are almost as horrific as Galrach, and there's nothing chaos about them. They're just really fucking scary. Sounds um, great. You know, there's like uh, there's um, oh, I can't remember what her name is, but there's a uh, Umbra the Dread who lives out in the Darklands. She mm -hmm. is fucking terrifying. Um, and there's nothing chaos about her. She's technically a a, a form of a death dragon, um, a really big one, and like. The Chaos Dwarves are scared shitless of her. Um, Tarmacon helps fight her, and all Tarmacon and his entire army, plus the entire might of the Black Tower managed to do, was force her to go back to sleep. <laughs> that was that was the amount of damage they were able to do to her. Um, so, you know, there are dragons that could handle someone like Alrach in a really... Now, watching them mate would probably be brain-meltingly awful, but, uh, you know, it could happen. Uh, what would happen if the demon was exercised from Galrach? Nothing good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if Galrach had it his way, he would die immediately. I think that possibly would be the only way to exercise the demon. Um, I don't think you are... Uh, this is a greater demon. Greater demons can't be exercised under any normal circumstance. All you can do is kill the host. That's it. You're doomed. In the same way that the vast majority of demons in the Warhammer world, you can't exercise them. Getting rid of them kind of doesn't work because the taint lies within forever. There is no easy way out of this. So in this particular case, I would suggest it probably couldn't happen. But yes. that doesn't that doesn't mean that it wouldn't make for a really fun story um, for someone trying to attempt it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exercising demons is like, if you accomplish that, you're borderline a god in human flesh. Yeah, uh, it's pulling off it, like like, there's a whole, like, one of the things that people are like, oh, Sigmar is a god, is there's a story about Sigmar exercising someone. Um, supposedly. Um, granted, and, but it comes off much more like a parable than an actual story. Yeah. But, uh, anyway. Um, Isian, thank you so much for the super chat. Happy Lord Recursitation Day! <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a way to put it. Proud to say my starter group, the Ubers Reich 7, are ready for a campaign. The Pirates of Lustria. Oh, Nice! Any career books you recommend beyond core, lustre, and winds of magic? I would happily recommend the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Companion book from 2nd Edition, which has a lot of worldly uh, editions, so a lot of sea monsters and other things like that. Uh, if you're looking at 4th Edition, I would also heck heavily recommend the Sea of Claws book because it has a lot of fun rules about how to use naval vessels and stuff. Um, granted, if those rules are good or not, I don't know. I haven't used them myself, and knowing Cubicle Seven's track record, eh. But um, <laughs> it does have uh, it does have a lot of really fun things to explore, like the Great Ocean, um, and does give a lot of really fun information that you can use. So those are the two books I would probably heavily lean on. That's good. Yeah. Also, the uh, for second edition, also the Tome of Corruption might actually have a surprising <laughs> amount of good good info. If you're looking for second edition books, you can't help but see. 
go check out the career book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're looking course, for yeah, careers. The, the There's a whole career. book of careers, but that's going to be more making your own careers from existing ones. Plus, um, the careers in second edition are so different to fourth, where fourth includes four at least careers in one, where second is just lots of single individual careers. Yeah, now, Tintel, in Total War, should Galrach be Zinch or Warriors of Chaos, Legendary Lord, Legendary Hero? In my opinion, I would have him be a legendary hero that's kind of on par with like your Lord Croak, your Ariel, where he's like a really, really powerful character you're able to attach onto armies, and he has a bunch of unique gimmicks and abilities. And I would say it'd be fine for him to be available to both Zinch and the Warriors of Chaos because he originates from the Warrior of Chaos books. Uh, actually, the first book he was introduced was Horse of Chaos, which was actually Mortals Horse. and Demons combined. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's fine for him to be available to both. Uh, and fun in his original rules, you could not take him as a general. You could attach him onto armies, but he very explicitly could not lead them. Um, he was more like a horrific force of nature that showed up as opposed yep. to a general. So I think keeping him that way is best. Could only agree with that. Um, although they, uh, his later rules do give you the suggestion that as a greater demon of Zinch, that sometimes leading is the correct way forward. Yes, and you can take him as a general in like 8th edition. Uh, they opened up his rules yeah, quite a bit. Uh, still loading. How would you end Galrach in the end times? Mm -hmm. uh, I would probably do a story of his Lord of Change pulling off some big scheme, but it builds up to Gal It. I would lean into the tragedy aspect of it, where maybe Galrach manages to successfully avert some terrible end by finally ending himself, and it's more about the involvement of some other faction or some other special characters who are able to break through the Lord of Changes control enough that Galrach is able to successfully kill the demon, of course, at the cost of himself. Yeah, so uh, what you really want here is a conclusion to the core arc of Galrach, which is um, the great loss that Galrach feels um, eternally weakening him to the point that the greater demon can do whatever it wants using his body. So one of the better ways, one of the ways, not better ways, but one way to resolve that would be having perhaps one of the descendants of his original pal um, being at the heart of a stab to try and break through to the Galrouch within, allowing them to break up the big, huge, nasty thing that it's attempting to do. But ultimately, it being Zinch, that success should be a failure. And by that, I mean they succeed, but by succeeding, they free the greater demon, allowing it to go and do what it actually wants to do, which is a really nice way of using Zinch in general, which is even when you succeed, in this case, we have freed the dragon, the dragon has killed itself, the demon is gone, thank goodness, that mist rises up, and the demon is now free to wreak absolute havoc in a world where there's no vortex anymore. So what they've basically done is screw up massively. But Gal Rauch is free. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. 100%. Uh, Commander Brown, hi guys. Uh, this <laughs> this time, not so late. Uh, I missed the time when Gal Rauch wasn't the only progenitor of the Chaos Dragons, but also all the monsters in the Chaos Waste, which is what we, we talked about. The, uh, yeah, we earlier. were discussing that. And I think that that time hasn't necessarily gone. That time is just somewhat more opaque. Yeah, yeah. If you want to run with the idea that he like created a couple of other species, I think that's totally viable. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jonathan Scott, how would the Cathayan dragons interact with slash fight Gal Roch? Also, is there any connection between him and the Chaos Corrupted Cathayan dragon? Uh, I will say, with the idea that Gal Roch travels around the world every once in a while, and he's basically a Lord of Change that's up to some horrible shit, and he is a master at mutating dragons, the idea that he would be involved with Flame Fling. Uh, who was the, uh, in my head canon, though it's not confirmed, uh, the Chaos Corrupted Zinch Dragon of Cathay, who's supposedly one of the nine dragon children, Galrach would be critical to Central. that plot. Like, yeah. He should be a huge player in that plot. Yeah, and if he's not, then the, whoever wrote the lore dumb fucked up. Because if you, you need to make the corruption of such an entity big, special, and interesting. And there are few entities out there that match that capability. But Galrach is one of them. So definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, especially if you're running with the idea that you have this dragon child who you're kind of exploring their story. And the story is that they try to go out and stop Galrach alone to like prove themselves or to do some kind of thing, mm. um, maybe against the advice of their father or some of the other dragon kids. And that ends up leading to their corruption as they as they entangle with Galrach, that would be a very, very good story to tell. Yep, good story to tell. Completely agree. 
Uh, Sigmar performs exorcisms to the mercy of Galmaraz meeting your face. You're not wrong. Yeah, you're not wrong at all, actually. <laughs> nope, you're not wrong, Miss Big. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much straight on there. Yeah, and Age of Sigmar, he literally does that. If you get bonked by Galmaraz and there's anything redeemable about you, you will literally be redeemed. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to dive into some specifics. Yes! So, uh, Garrach has a couple of really, really cool moments where he pops up throughout the lore, uh, where he basically terrorizes most races at least once. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the story that I would like to start with, uh, because uh, it's just kind of in his book, so it makes it easy to kind of knock out, is that although we do not get the name of it, there is an entire dwarf hold that Garrach destroys. We do get the name of it. Oh, we do? Go ahead. Yeah, it's Karak Flag. Really? Yeah, it's Karak Flag. Um, and that's oh, mentioned in a... Damn. That, yeah, I know. Oh, um, damn. Okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> like, for those of you who know your lore, this is one that's astonishing. Um, but yeah, it does get named Karak Flag. Um, and it only gets named in one place that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I can screenshot it. It's White Dwarf number 274. I know because I went and well, found White what, Dwarf number 274 in my old book. Dream. Um, so White Dwarf number 274 makes it very clear. Now, here we go with White Dwarf number number 274's version, which is not necessarily the same as the rest. I'm going to drop in an extra couple of details before that. Almost all of the stories of Galrauch, Galrauch, I apologize, come really late. Um, we don't really get much of what he does during that. In fact, I'll pause there for you too. Yeah, sorry, I just, uh, we, we missed this. And I just want to call it. Yeah, quick for his present. Present. Would you say with the actual dragon trying to kill itself, it's succumbed to despair? I wouldn't actually say Galrach has succumbed to despair, actually. No. Um, I think if he, had succumbed to, yeah, if he had succumbed to s s despair, Give he up. would have given up. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the, don't, don't mistake how dramatic and dark his solution is to being giving up. It's not that he's like, oh, I'm going to die because I'm not willing to fight anymore. It's, I will never stop fighting until I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that exactly. Um. Yeah, Galrauch, the Golden Drake does not give up. Um, I don't think despair is correct here. Um, so, Sorry, Gal yeah, so Galrauch um, has been given a host of different things that he's done in his time, but almost all of them are almost at the end times, or at least 500 years leading up to that. Mm. The only one with a nice clear date is around about 1846 in the 8th edition, where Galrauch um, is attacked. Well, he isn't attacked. He's uh, shows up, up in 7th for the first time. Um, pardon? A seventh edition is the first appearance of that timeline note. Yeah, um, so it's up seventh, thanks. Um, where uh, the Hung and the Orcs are having themselves a big, huge, massive fight um, on the outside. And it's an enormous battle. Um, and Gal Rauch wakes up because of the din, or alternatively, because this is possibly one of the ever-chosen attacks and the orcs of all people are holding it I was, I was about to say, which, I love which, the idea that the Hung got an ever-chosen and that they're probably this is probably taking place like above the Darklands and yeah. the law is what is stopping the ever-chosen. <laughs> which I think is brilliant and would make for a perfect story. So this is my head kind of what happens. Gal Rauch wakens up and let's imagine ourselves if we can, an enormous horde of orcs, a truly enormous one and on the other side a seemingly never-ending horde of hung coming down from the north and galrauch wakes up swoops over and attacks the lot of them doesn't attack one side or the other just lashes out because clearly this is not part of the greater demon's plan it either doesn't want to be awake or perhaps you could argue this isn't a moment where galrauch himself is awake and he's stopping an ever chosen, which I think is also a super fun reading of it. It's worth noting to reinforce Andy's point that Galrach has specific rules where if you rolled the worst case scenario on his Spirit of Galrach check, like you rolled a 12, not Galrach wouldn't attack himself. It's that the Gold Drake would take full control of their Complete body control. and he would turn around and attack the Chaos Army. So this is a moment where I really like to think we got our double six twelve result. Um, wakes up and just scours the lot of them. Now our orcs are terrified of this. They send up six enormous wyverns to take it out. No, he eats them all and then proceeds to kill everything. Now, when I say his stats don't match this, this is what I'm talking about. He takes out the entire hung and orc army. Sending them to flight before 
slipping back to sleep again for the big event, which happens a few years later when Karak Vlag is actually taken out. And it's interesting it's dated as well because it's dated at about um, the uh, incursion of chaos with Magnus. So it's mm. 2302, Karak Vlag, that's when it happens. And we have a story of Karak Vlag that sits on one side, and then we have the completely different story that sits underneath with Galrauch, which is that Galrauch is in a state of slumber come the arrival of chaos and is deep, deep, deep beneath the World's Edge Mountains at this point and is sleeping, and is sleeping on a great pile of treasure now you might go that sounds a little bit tolkien and stereotypical well yeah there's clearly a reason that it's been done because all of this treasure is cursed every single last piece of it by the greater demon the greater demon has basically set itself up as one gigantic dwarf trap this is a honey trap and it sits there down there beneath one of the dwarf holds one of the most northerly dwarf holds as a giant dwarf honey trap and guess what happens? As the world is waxing with magic and the dwarfs are sniffing out the craziest stuff that may lie below, they find Galrach down below. <sighs> well, I think you're going to guess that this isn't going to go well if you know anything about Karak Vlag. It is not going to go well. To begin with, they're completely overcome. They have to have this treasure. They start trying to steal it. Galrach wakens up. And to cut a very long story short, He's already inside the hold in the tunnels. So all of the wards, all of the runes, all of the great defences the dwarves have in place to stop the arrival of something like Galrach don't matter because they've built out and incorporated the dragon's lair within their hold. And it sleep, seeps through the tunnels and murders all of them. Literally yeah. every single last one. And I'm going to drop one extra detail that this little um, tale on its side does. One of the important tales. So extraordinary is the magic that is unleashed during the course of this to take out the dwarves that Karak Vlag falls into the realm of chaos. That the entirety of the hold falls into the realm of chaos. And at this material point where Karak Vlag used to be, it slips in and out and is a complete repository of demons hidden in the center of the World's Edge Mountains, but wrapped up with all of the winds of magic, making it impossible to find. Basically, this story that was dropped in a white dwarf sets up the whole idea of a massive demon host that can be led out from the World's Edge Mountains at any time they wish. But there's, of course, on the other version, some other details too. Yeah, plus, if you're running with the idea of this Lord of Change doing what he can to set up events... This is now a huge ally for Kislev and the Northern Defenders against the Chaos Hosts that's now been completely removed from the equation. So yeah. there is no longer a dwarf ally that will come from the East. It's, it's fascinating as well because um, unlike some of the other tales of Karak Vlag, um, there are survivors. They are marked as clearly having survived and come out from the hold saying that the enormous quantity of sorcerers blast coming their way shattered all of the runes, completely destroyed them. The hold was wiped out. But unlike some of the other Karak Vlag stories, um, where they say nobody knows what happened, it specifically calls out that there were survivors and that they passed down over to the rest of the Karak Ankor, and they mentioned that the Northern Hold had been lost. This contradicts other sources, but be aware, this isn't uncommon. Um, yeah. welcome, welcome as the entirety of this <laughs> hold collapses to chaos, and with the waxing of the chaos winds, Ga Gal Rauch then comes out and is active for some time. It's marked in that story that he'd been sleeping for centuries by this point. Um, and given the date, which is 2300, it does suggest that this is the first time that he's been awake since he took out the Hung and he took out the Orcs, because that was about 500 and a bit years earlier, which I think ni nicely matches yeah, with it works. centuries. It's just it's super perfect. Um, so Karak Vlag was taken out by Galrauch. Um, that is as confirmed as you can get in any article. That's what happened to it. And it's horrendous what he does to the place because it collapses into the realm of chaos, gives him enough energy through all of the souls that he eats, through all the artifacts that he takes. The honey trap that he set before for the dwarves is sprung during the great incursion of chaos. He wipes those dwarves out, except for a few that apparently get away, and then rises out to take part in the uh, great war against chaos and possibly given the nature of this was probably at Prague or probably at uh, Kislev gates alongside 
well, as we all know, as of our cold, you're yeah, ever chosen at that point. I am I am deeply hoping we'll get him uh for the old world because if they bring yeah. that narrative back, which they've been doing a pretty okay job with bringing back yeah. certain stories for the old world, uh, that would be a beautiful way to reintroduce him into the setting. Um, Absolutely would because yeah. it completely fits in and it really does set up everything for the old world really neatly. Um, and it's from this point that Galrauch does uh, apparently the vast majority of his old world gubbins. And um, before that, as it marks in this particular article, before that he'd been everywhere else in the world. And it's at this point and onwards that he, for example, goes to Britonia and goes to his next big, yeah, his like, next big thing, uh, Lenguin de Lac. Um, so this story is really fun because it reinforces <laughs> what Andy just said, and it actually introduces something that Galrach does in particular, which is that when he attacks a place, he doesn't just destroy it, he violates it. Mm -hmm. Um, so Lenguin de Lac, we don't know exactly where it is in Bretonia, to my knowledge, it's somewhere in Bretonia. Um, but there is I can't a think of where it might be. Yeah, there's a city which, based on the name, it's next to a lake somewhere. Um, but there is a city in Bretonia that for whatever reason, Galrach is drawn to it, likely because there were some great heroes there or some other reason that it was pivotal in a particular plot, but whatever reason he goes there and he attacks the city and it's a massacre. He obliterates everyone. And once again, you know why he attacked? Did you mention why he attacked? Pardon me. My brain was away there. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> why did he attack? Okay. So he attacks because, um, the Duke de Lac, um, had recently slain one of his kids. Um, and by that, I mean one of uh, Gal Rouse kids. Um, so uh, Gal Rouse flying around and senses that one of his kids has been slain down there. So swoops down to see whether they are effectively worthy. They are not. <laughs> <laughs> they really are not. There's a big skull of the dragons. It might even be two skulls. Can't recall the story directly. Two skulls of the um, dragon that are uh, sitting on the battlements. Um, and down comes Galrock, the, the daddy of all dragons, to basically take revenge for the death of its own child. But it's fair to say that when it sent the, uh, its own child, it wasn't so much going down to see, oh, I, I, I wonder who killed it. It was more, I wonder if this one's worthy of me and went down to check it out and found it dead at the hands of humans, which, as we all know, is about to go very wrong for the poor humans. Yeah, so Galrach unleashes hell upon this place. And once again, when thinking about what Galrach is capable of, you're talking about an elder dragon who uh, unfortunately got a stat list that didn't improve with additions, even though it should have. Um, oh. you know, like, he was kind of a very decent standard dragon originally and then dragons went up to being like sevens and eights across the board but he stayed at sixes for some reason he should, really should have been eights across the board which would have been more thematic because eight is the number of chaos but anyway that's neither here nor here there um so he shows up and this is a dragon that has two heads that breathe two different forms of fire his original more golden drake head breeds really powerful actual fire but it's that incredible flame that's on par with the mightiest of star dragons and then his more nasty head it breathes literally the breath of change itself. Mm -hmm. And what's worth noting about the breath of change is bar none, none. This is one of the most powerful breath attacks in Warhammer Fantasy. Um, it's one of the few things they got right about him in the later editions where in eighth edition, his breath of change is if you're touched by it, it is toughness test or die. Yep. Like no, no ward saves. No regen, no armor, doesn't matter how many wounds you have, toughness test or die. Because you basically mutate into a chaos spawn and just collapse in on yourself. And that's the weaker Warhammer version of it as well. Let's be fair. If that was uh, sitting on tabletop uh, fantasy roleplay, it would be awful. Oh, yeah, yeah. From a lore perspective, it would be so much wow. more powerful even. Yeah. I'm it's instant death. Awful. It's, yeah, it's, instant and death. it's not a good death either. It's not a clean you, death. You it is. As your body bursts, it's a little bit like you've just had fleshy curse cast upon you. Um, the, the chaos spell, fleshy curse, where you basically just turn into a mutant. It's truly awful. Yeah, so Galrach, and also he's one of the most powerful Zinx wizards. Uh, like he was a full on level four, except for mm -hmm. he had the lore master trait, so he knows all the spells known to Zinch. Um, yeah. And then he, he also. He was also originally a spell breaker, which meant that he any spells cast upon him, he could just choose any point during the battle to go that one there, dispelled, and roll a die on a four plus. I destroy the spell from your mind. Um, so he's a proper power. Yeah, that's wizard. the thing. You have like, you know, like imagine damsels or um prophetesses trying to unleash magic to 
thwart him and not realizing that this is Gorach, not a mere dragon. So he just looks at them and goes, no. And their magic just ceases to function. So anyway, moving back to good old Duke de Lac. Duke de Lac um, has a, a mighty chaos dragon that has just landed down in his land um, with both of its heads unleashing ears piercing screeches um as he on his bright white charger comes out to go and meet him much as he had met the previous dragon now if you know anything about good old bretonian heroes you know they are not so easily stopped not just because they have the favor of the lady as we all know a grail knight is basically a superhero the only thing they generally can't do is fly around in the sky with their cape flapping behind them. They can do pretty much everything else. And here is a perfect example of that. The good duke comes out like this with all of the various Bretonians on either side going, oh, swoon, finally we're saved. Everything's marvelous. I think you all know what's about to happen. No matter how enchanted his armor was as it gleams in the sun, Galrouch just pops out and disregarding the lance entirely. Yeah destroys him completely and utterly destroys him as if he is nothing and then being gal Rauch, destroys literally everything else too yeah the uh the dragon's breath <laughs> does that to yeah the good and old what's interesting is just like at karak uh vlag he causes a permanent damage which is that languid de lac such is the horrific amount of sorcery and magical flame and all that shit that he unleashes here, that it becomes permanently locked in an eternal night. Yeah, and interestingly as well, this the tales that are left of the place are, this is the repercussion for killing one of my get. Um, which I think is a fascinating um, view of how, the sort of stories that have led out of this. If you kill one of mine and display it like so, I will not only crush your people, I will take down all of your towers. I will wipe out every single last living soul and I will banish anything that comes to normal life within that area. As we say, Galrauch is not just a simple greater demon. He's a manifested greater demon with all of its powers and is also apparently quite vindictive. But I think that that's almost certainly apparent. Um, Greater demons of Zinch, after all, are all working to a great plan, and they are not so easily swayed from great plan. Yeah. Uh, so those are two very famous instances. There is actually another appearance of Galrash that not a lot of people know about because it's only in a Black Library novel, which is actually mm -hmm. the Sigvald novel, which is, once again, kind of goes to show how stupid powerful he is because Sigvald, everybody's <laughs> favorite absolute douche of Slanesh, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, one of his, uh, his favorite adopted son, actually faces off against Galrach as part of his epic saga. Now, granted, this is right before Sigvald becomes, like, the modern super epic badass Sigvald, but it is, he already has his regenerating armor, he already has uh, his legendary sword Sliver Slash, like, he's already, like, incredible. Um, and Sigvald actually goes up against Galrach, and the two of them have uh, a fight, because Sigvald stumbles into one of his caves where he's sleeping. Oops. Yeah, big oops. So <laughs> Galrach wakes up because Sigvald, uh, I believe like his demon prince patron was like, go do something about Galrach. And Sigvald fights him. Sigvald does everything in his power, right, to fight Galrach. And it goes horribly for him. When he gets burned by Galrach's flame, he manages to avoid the mutating fire, but he gets burned by the other fire. Sigvald's regeneration doesn't work. His hair gets burned off, his flesh gets scalded, he's mutilated, and he can't regenerate. Even when Galrach slashes him, he can't regenerate because Galrach's power is so mighty and he's so magically infused that Sigvald literally cannot heal from the damage he's taking. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the fight, Sigvald unleashing everything that he can, mm -hmm. Sigvald, you want to know what Sigvald does to Galrach with all of his mighty power? He dislodges one of his claws he manages to hurt one of his nails enough that his claw pops off and that's it that's all sigvald manages to do to him the only reason sigvald even survives the fight is because in a moment of frank genius to be honest from a sigvald perspective he starts singing an elven song from that he heard from an elf that was captured from ulthuan and taken to sigvald as a gift 
And he sings this song and it wakes up actual Galrach, the gold Drake. Like that song reaches him deep down and the gold Drake wakes up and immediately starts attacking the rest of his body. And because of that, Sigvald's able to escape. But think about that, that one of the most powerful mortal yeah. champions of Slanesh, by sheer stupid coincidence, and which, granted, is not really coincidence if you know anything about Warhammer and Fate. Chaos. Yeah, uh, quite. Yeah, chaos. Uh, through just, just the, the tiniest of thin wires survived an encounter with Galrach. Yeah. So if we're looking at Galrach and where he sits, um, in the greater pantheon of Warhammer things, um, he, the greater demon that lies within him is, let's just say, a greater demon. That much is certain. But the combination of greater demon but plus dragon have, I would argue, put Galrach on a higher pedestal, a much higher one granting that greater demon much more access to, to the mortal realms and much more freedom to do what it needs to do for the great plan of Zeech. Um, uh, the reason it smiles is because it's not only taken away one of the great weapons that the material plane has against the encroachment of chaos, it has subverted it and is now using it against the great mortal realms as they currently stand. And that, I feel really does put him up to the same sort of level as, and I know he's the butt of many jokes, but Belakor, um, mm. another extraordinarily powerful demon that is almost akin to the fifth power of chaos. But this one is very much one of the many heads of Zinch. And I think that's a good way of putting it, the great Hydra that is Zinch, because Zinch is not a consistent one god thing. It is all of its greater demons all working towards its greater plan and has many an interesting tale as to exactly what it is anyway. So Galrauch is one of these great heads and arguably one of the most capable because it's in the material plane. It's actually there. It can enact change directly without having to work through agents that are all fallible and bound up by the material realm. It has only one major flaw, and that's the fact that it is in a dragon, and that dragon sleeps and hibernates. The fact that that dragon raises up every once in a while within it and Gal Rauch tries to tear apart the other half of itself, or alternatively, help the enemies of Chaos, is, I think, a relatively minor and incidental detail as far as the Greater Demon is concerned. Because the Greater Demon has a plan which it intends to enact, and one can argue that Gal Rauch and the many entities that it creates, because the end of the White Dwarf article, and indeed it's suggested also in 6th edition as well, as I recall, but I've read that book in a long time, um, is that Gal Rauch is actively come the end times filling the world full of monsters truly yeah. horrendous monsters that are coming down and will come out from the realm of chaos during the final act of the world you could argue that pretty much any major monster that you see in the end times on the side of chaos is a direct application of galrauch's will and in this case the, the, I don't want to call it that name again. I refuse to... Just say Lord of Change. Just do what I do. Just say Lord the of Change. The Lord of Change. Yeah, totally. It needs a good name. Um, fake... Fuck off. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Lord of Change that's within it is directly responsible for the end times as we understand it. And to reinforce... I mean, it's not just important. You could argue that because of Gal Rauch, Archeon won. Yeah. It, it, and it's it's interesting to say that when you're thinking about Galrach, like Andy said, this isn't just a dragon. It's not just a greater demon. It's not just mm -hmm. a greater demon in a dragon's body. Um, it, he's a creator god, which is horrific to think about. I mean, if you're looking at what a god is in Warhammer, if it wasn't underneath Zinch or a part of Zinch, it would be a god. Yeah. It would just be a material god. It would make the dragons in, say, Dragon Age look like absolute wusses. It would make the dragons in games such as, say, I mean, some of the dragons in um, Elden Ring are pretty mental, but it would make the dragons in many of the computer <laughs> games you know and love look really 
small, and I don't necessarily mean small physically, I mean small in terms of their impact, small in terms of what they are, it is effectively a god, but it's part of Zinch. It's part of the greater entity that is the chaos god, Zinch. So it's basically a god within a god. Um, in the same way that Belakor is effectively a god, and it has been desperately trying to become the fifth power of chaos, and has, as we know, not really succeeded. Um, so, yeah, Galrauk is not sm a small fry. Yeah, also, holy shit, I just realized the time, so we're going to blow through the very last bits of this, because um, we're running out of time. Um, we, we can't be, all right? We're only coming up to six. Wait, I forget. Do we go for three hours or two hours? We go for three. Okay, we got having, all straight. the time all right. in the world. Never mind. I was about to panic. I was like, oh, fuck. Uh, okay, good. We're doing good. Okay, okay. We're, good. Uh, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, good. Good. All right. Sorry. I uh, had a stroke there for a minute about timing. Uh, Mandatis, uh, the ancient dragon cave in Middenland. Uh -huh. uh, it's said to be from the Far East missing for eons. Would you say that's one of Ulrich's mistakes, or do you think Galrach may be this missing dragon? Okay, so I, I found this one really fascinating. I'm really glad you brought it up, Mandatis, actually, because that ancient dragon cave has been discussed by more than one individual um, behind the scenes um, and is often cited as justification for the Drakvald being the Drakvald. I will also note that Drakvald wasn't originally going to be called Drakvald. It was Darkvald, but they made a typo. Um, <laughs> and, but they liked the typo, so they kept yeah. it. Okay, so when one of That's the maps so it got funny. marked as it got marked as Drakvald um, in the Empire, so th uh, and that became the Drake World of Dragon um, uh, Forest. Uh, and the whole Drakvalder mentality was uh, suddenly changed. Its colors changed to the greens and the reds of dragons um, as Drakvald itself became far more centered on dragon iconography before Drakvald was eventually destroyed many, 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 many moons ago. Um, and the idea that Galra could be that dragon um, was suggested and dismissed, I thought somewhat sadly, behind the scenes in the attempt to try and create something that was unique for that area that was tied directly through to the old electric counts of Drakvald, um, and that they potentially had dragons on side in the same way that come the modern incarnation of Warhammer. Um, you could put oh, good old Karl Franz on a great imperial dragon because of reasons, um, and they thought it might be nice to tie that in there. Um, and uh, I thought personally back then, because Galrauk was a thing by this point, it would be much more fun to have had this place be one of the sources of all the problems that the Drakvald has with beastmen, with monsters. And just take a look at the beastmen army list, all the crazy creatures you get in there. And for me, it was a really good point of basically saying that was his lab where he did stuff. And the result are things like jabber slides and other horrendous monsters that make their way across the empire. So to answer your question, I think it makes a really good answer. It's never been answered. So if you want to do that for your own games, I'd say go for it. I think it's great. And I would almost certainly go for it if you were going with that one. It being a horrendous laboratory that was used to create the worst that the Drakvold can offer. Yeah, I, I would agree immensely. Um, I always found it funny that because Games Workshop refused to answer that, I don't know uh, if Andy's seen it, the, the way that Total War tried to answer what the hell the ancient dragon cave is because they were uh -huh. like, oh, well, shit, we got to do something. Uh, they made it a map. And so instead of making it that like a dragon used to live there um, and that was its cave, they made it where it was such a colossal ancient dragon that died that its bones are the cave. So it's huh. the ancient dragon cave because an ancient dragon died and its skull, giant skull is used as a cave for people. Which you is know like, what my biggest yeah. problem with that is? I love that, but my biggest problem is if they ever make Galrauk, um in the game, it's got to be at least that big. Oh yeah, and it's like horrifically huge. <laughs> of course! <laughs> it's not going to work as an actual dragon because Galrauk is a dragon like that. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that falls into, you know, it's like, as much as we all love Colex on Eater and Total War, he's nowhere close to how he's, large he would canonically be. Uh, yeah. He would be at least two or three times larger, at minimum. Um, you know, if he's not towering over the walls of the cities you're attacking, then he's too small. Uh, <laughs> um, but I will say, yeah, I love that story. I love the idea that also opens up the idea for there to be myths about him fighting one of, like, the ancient gods of the Empire, whether that's Ulrich in a big final confrontation or Sigmar yeah. if you want to make it something more contemporary. Uh, but you could do some really cool shit with that. I think Ulrich uh, would make a great one. 
Yep. And Age of Sigmar with Destruction Factions have a different understanding of a two-headed dragon, Gorkamorka's chosen or so. And Age of S, uh, AOS, yes, 100%. I think they would very much, uh, even in fantasy, the idea of a twin-headed creature being blessed by Gork and Mork is something that's introduced in a couple of places. Um, like if you read the Scarsick novel, there's a goblin that has a mutation where he has two heads and the greenskins are like, oh, obviously he's blessed by Gork and Mork. Um, uh, On mutant goblins, just as a small aside, um, we got forbidden from using them at all in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay because um, greenskins didn't mutate, um, which caused us immediate problems because one of the most famous scenes in the very first adventure um, in The Enemy Within involves a mutant goblin. And uh, we had already established this. We got approval for it and everything. And I was just sitting there happy going, oh, the book's about to come. Everything's cool. We've still got our mutant goblin. We've, we're have we cool. And then I got a call saying, you have to remove it. Um, and I was like, <laughs> wait, what? But the cover is is finished and it's out there on the internet. We can't, It's got freaking three legs. How can I? How, it's out there. And they went, mm, you're right. It is public. You can keep it this once. Thank fuck. <laughs> we will allow it. <laughs> um, we almost lost one of the most iconic scenes um, because of Games Workshop's desire to ensure that their core models were always supported. And obviously, mutants are not supported by the core model releases of Warhammer. That's so silly. I mean, uh, I feel really... like anyone could literally just turn around and be like, well, you haven't released like any mutant minis in forever. So, <laughs> like, hey, it is what it is. Yeah, uh, Hammond. Why Andy didn't call himself Galhammer? Disappointed. You're you're right. I could have or or Rouchhammer. Rouchhammer. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. The Laughing God. Is there a bleeding of the personalities or influence of each other because of the Greater Demon Gal? Roch feels a little undemony a bit to me. We have to keep in mind that because he's a material being now, he's probably not able to think and comprehend like he used to. He has to he has to obey the laws of reality. Um, he's no yeah. longer got an etheric presence. That is the bit that most people forget. And it was something that, um, sadly, I didn't manage to get in completely before I left from my last job working on Warhammer. Um, when we were dealing with a demon that takes place in the very first book, Enemy in Shadows, um, where the demon had stopped doing what it was supposed to be doing because it was kind of digging being in the material realms. And it was now in a material mind with material thoughts, material needs, material things. And that was changing the demon, which is, of course, somewhat ironic, given it was a demon of change. And that was going to be a core irony of that character. And sadly, I didn't quite manage to nail that when I was doing my edits where I went, because I did my last edit and went, right, I need to put this bit in. Oh, I've resigned now. Off I go. And then the book comes out without it. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> I, I, I sent it. God damn it. Meaning that that core irony was not put in place. But yes, material creatures uh, have different issues. And a demon coming into a material entity and possessing it will be left in a material creature. So I would say that bleeding of personality, probably not. Bleeding of influence, probably not. Not sounding greater demony more likely because of its long-term inhabit uh, inhabitation of the mortal realms. It's no longer in the aether. Its mind isn't working in a timeless environment, but instead within one that is caught up with the rules of reality. Yeah, it's like he's got to deal with the fact that he is in a dragon's body and a dragon's brain. So he's and he's hungry. Deal, yeah, he's got to deal with and, the, yeah, entire... And, eat, and eating is good. It, it gives him feelings. Yeah. Um, things that demons themselves don't necessarily have at all. Material plane is, is just as dangerous for demons as the realm of chaos is for mortals, but in very different ways. You could even argue it's one of the reasons they're trying to destroy it. That's why, that's why he can't be <laughs> Oh, Lindsay, <laughs> spot on! I missed that comment. <laughs> nah, I love that. <laughs> Jonathan Scott, so is Galrach like a Dark Souls boss? The Duke says, I did it. I killed the dragon. Wait, why did the music stop? Why didn't the music stop? Why is the chorus changing? <laughs> oh, Jonathan Cott. <laughs> yeah, it, it's totally that. And I have been there is that playing a with. <laughs> oh, man. Play, playing from Softwares games, and you're like, da, 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 da. Yeah, I've killed the thing. Why are we still going? Why are we. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah that i Perfect. think one of my favorite uh reaction compilations is watching uh the elders or the um 
Dark Souls 3 boss that has three phases. So people kill the second phase and they're like, yeah! Yay. And then a cutscene plays and they're like, oh no! <laughs> oh god! <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, anyway, so Galrach is between Tiamat and Ancalagon the Black from Lord of the Rings. Uh, he's And as far as the effect he has on the world, I would say yes. Uh, obviously, physically, he's quite dramatically different. Like, he's yeah. not nearly as big as Ancalagon the Black is. Uh, where Ancalagon's like the size of a continent or whatever crazy bullshit. Um, but uh, like Tiamat and him are pretty similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, Watchdog, what do you think the Drakvald Runefang, uh, do you think it could do anything to Galrach? Yeah, um, so my one does, um, and specifically does arguably for this reason. Um, the uh, various rules for the Runefangs are, if you go to the battle game, identical. They always just make them super, super simple. Which is dumb. Um, which I agree is dumb. If you go over to Total War, you'll find each one of the Rune Fangs has got its own little tweak, which adds its own little funky little special rule, which is super fun. Um, but in my version, absolutely, it's got Demons of Dragon Slay um, for the very reason it's the Drakfeld Rune Fang. And it's called Drak Tuki Dragon's Tooth, Dragon's Fang, and it's designed to kill dragons. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, Galrach would be like, oh shit, <laughs> against that yeah. particular sword. Uh, yeah, he's still a dragon at the end of the day. Yeah, there's I think there's something here that people often forget with the lore, and that's that um it's very easy to say character A would easily win because of event A, where event A has literally nothing to do with what they're facing at the moment. Um, for example, there's a reason that uh, say, for example, good old Gal Rauch has never been killed by say the Drakval Drunfang. Because he's not stupid enough to go up against someone who could use it effectively against him. The reason that long lived characters live for so long is because they avoid things that can cause them to die. And that's something that is really easily forgotten. If you just read lore stories where it goes, ha ha ha, character like Galrock comes in and destroys all the hung and all the orcs with ease. Yeah, but none of them were proper dragon slayers. None of them were specifically in a position where they could effectively take out a character like him. So you should always remember that for every character that looks super powerful, in the Warhammer world, there's another 50 things that could kill it. Every single time, nothing is indestructible. Even the indestructible thing will at some point have some writer come along and say, ha, throw the power, splat! That's the sort of thing that happens in Warhammer. So be aware that uh, Galrauch is... So long lived because he's cunning. Yeah. Um, yeah. In Warhammer Fantasy, avoiding things that are a problem is actually far more important than anything else. Like it's nine tenths of the game. <laughs> like you might be like, oh, like, oh, surely there are no characters to stand against him, but there are weapons that are specifically designed to deal with things like Galrach. Like you may not think, like, oh, Felix surely would be doomed without Gotrek against Galrach, but it's like Felix's sword is demonstrated to be able to block. The breath attacks of dragons, no matter how powerful they are. Like yeah. Garrosh would see Felix and be like, "Not today." <laughs> not, not Particularly after going puff, and then Felix yeah. is still standing there. Oh, really? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go do something else. Uh, Eddie Victory, if I understand it right, Galrach's flame can cause horrible mutations that will kill whoever it touches. What would it do to someone who already has horrible mutations like Throg or Morger? Well, they're two very different characters, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. In the case of so it would be interesting. In the case of Throg, you would kind of basically do the eternal thing of how his regenerating body would cope with handling the mutations. And if he could basically keep it under control, which he might, Throg's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then Galrosh would use his other th head and, Gal and Throg would die immediately. <laughs> Incinerate. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Morger is a lot more tricky because Morger is more like an etheric entity stuffed into a body that is still trying to obey the laws of the ether so he's always changing and always just this like sloppity mess honest from a lore perspective Galrach's breath of change would obviously mutate morger but i don't think that would bother morger yeah um i agree um in fact my previous point of there is always something that breaks the rule morger breaks the rule here Nothing is immune to everything. Nothing is indestructible. Nothing is um, so powerful that it will destroy everything. There is always something out there that will be able to stand against your ultimate weapon. And you might go, yeah, but what could stop Widowmaker, the Sword of Cain? 
well, God survived being attacked by it, so I'm going to say quite a lot of things. They are mm. enormously powerful weapons, yes, and this is an enormously powerful breath attack. But as we note, if we just look at the warmer rules, toughness te chest, you survive. You can survive it. It can be survived. That's written into the rules. In terms of what it actually does on the battlefield, everyone just mutates and dies. But someone like Morgor, yeah, no! Morgor is pretty much the unique entity that will come out of that, looking at that dragon going, yeah, what's next? Incinerate. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that hurt. I'll come back later, you bastard. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Damn yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah Morgor, I mean, that would literally be the equivalent of trying to pick up, like, a Molotov cocktail and throwing it into a burning building to put it out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you're, you're not doing anything. Yeah, you, uh, you need something bigger than a Molotov cocktail to take out a fire. Yeah. Uh, Electric Kind of Story, I love these streams. Any chance lower your topic votes will include past topics that didn't win? Yes, we have been doing If you pay close yeah, we do attention, that. we do that. Yeah, um, we do. For instance, Vlad von Karstein. That was a character mm -hmm. who had lost a previous vote, and we he had a second chance, and he won this time. Yeah, that was a super fun, super fun one because we ended up in places that I think a lot of people didn't expect. And I think that's um, one of the joys of our streams. We're trying not to just simply state what a book says. We're trying to rationalize it all into something that makes sense, given the stories that we have. Yeah, well, and that's and I think that's the core concept of Lore Beers that makes it so fun for me and Andy is we're not here to read the wiki to you guys. You're a yeah. You can look up that shit by yourselves. You don't need us for totally. that. Um, we're here to try and show you the connecting threads that makes Warhammer Warhammer based on everything that we have and how you can make your own fun stories and stuff. And maybe yeah. one day, if some of y'all, you know, are able to write for GW one day, maybe you could take those critical thinking skills with you to make a better universe. Um, oh, oh you, you've just made me shiver. Yes, that. <laughs> yes, that. Critical thinking skills. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but yes, yeah, dying to see the What Are Greenskins stream. We will probably have Greenskins come up in another vote uh, pretty near in the future. Um, mm. I already know what I want to do, I think, for the next poll, which won't be this week. It'll be next week because uh, we're doing Grumbrand until next week. But Can I interrupt with just one little comment because I want to bring this one for Richard um, because this is a known thing. Reddit Air with International Rescue um, did that when several of, uh, did that, pardon me, with an oil rig just not that far from here in Scotland, back in the, I think it was the 80s, where they blew up the oil rig to stop the fire. Um, because you can obviously uh, blow a fire, uh, uh, an existing flyer away, and it can be done. And yes, this is a thing you can do, but you need a pretty goddamn big explosion. And I'm sorry to say that um, yeah, you'll, a stream you'll of I... mutation is not enough to take out the ultimate mutating creature. Yeah, I I kept my thing very small, like a little volatile cocktail into a house fire <laughs> yeah. isn't going to do anything. I, I think Sotek was pretty much spot on with his uh, analogy there. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, due to their unpredictable and emotional driven nature to fight amongst themselves, which greater demon would try to fight Galrach and who might win? Anyone's willing to fight anyone. Uh, it's a battle game is what yeah. Warhammer World's based on. So the universe is designed for people to slap each other in the face as much as possible. And that also means one of the many heads of Zinch fighting against Gal Rauch's um, overall plans as well, because Zinch is an inconsistent deity, or alternatively, they were meant to meet and one was meant to appear to have lost. There's always with Zinch an extra layer, so there's never an excuse not to have them kicking living crap out of each other, because that could just be part of the greater plan. Yeah, and if you wanted to do something really fun, like if you were running with uh, what Andy did that has completely changed my life and how I look at Warhammer, which I love so much, of what he did with 4th edition where you're trying to take all these prior writings mm. that obviously were not designed with each other in mind and just flat out conflicted, and you try and go, well, let's coalesce this into a cohesive story and pull in as many things. One thing you could do to play around with that, to answer your question, Necromancer, is that in one version of the story... Egrim von Horseman dominated Galrach for a time, and then he lost control and got his ass kicked, and then he went to go find Baldros. Uh, so you could take that story and do something with it of maybe there is a tale that before Egrim freed Baldros from beneath, maybe he did have an encounter with Galrach, and they faced yeah. off with one another, and they had a wizard's duel, and something happened there that uh, Egrim eventually loses and then goes after Gal or Baldros who's a more attainable thing. Or maybe Galrach gives him the information of Baldros to, was play, go to play into the corruption of Egrim um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like there, which once again could run with what we kind of were talking about with the Cathayan Dragon Child, where you could have Galrach be this very critical character to the lore in that he's corrupting a lot of really noble champions of the, of the light, um, which would be very fun. I think not just fun. I think that's um, a, a 
a brilliant idea. And I think it's something that many writers for Warhammer don't do. And that is their due diligence. If you want to write for Warhammer, Warhammer is always at its best if you've read all the books. Now, I don't mean every single last tiny novel, because many of the novels are filled with absolute nonsense that have little to do with the core lore as it's presented inside the battle books or anywhere else it might be, because individual authors might not have been edited as tightly as they could have been to ensure that what they were writing matches the Warhammer world. But I do mean every army list, read them all, including the older ones, because often the older ones, the later material doesn't contradict the older stuff. Indeed, it complements it rather than contradicts it. Read the roleplay books that are relevant to what you're doing. There is not an enormous amount of work there. It, there just isn't. And then when you're going on to a subject that is going to be your core writing point, go check the wikis. It's not hard. The wikis <laughs> might say, no. it, back in White Dwarf number 274, it's Karak Vlag. Now, I'm not sure the wiki does say that because I don't know how good the wikis are. But I knew it was Karak Vlag um, because it's in a White Dwarf out there. And that's one of those facts that are super easy to miss if you don't read the White Dwarves. But it's also super easy to go and do a bit of checking up. And it's our job here at Lorebeards to try and take all of those parts because the writers clearly aren't and try to rationalize it in a way that you can then go, OK, I see how that all makes sense. And I can see why I would try to make it like this in one of my games. Yeah, and I will say that uh, if you're like, oh, but I've heard so many bad things about the wikis, yeah, yeah, yeah. The important thing, the best thing you can do for the wiki is to use it just like you would Wikipedia if you were actually doing a mm -hmm. research project, which is don't take the article at face value. Scroll down to the bottom where hopefully they reference all their sources and now you can go look up the original sources. Yeah, go read the source because you'll often find the source is completely different to what the article says. The articles are, are a mixture of copy-paste and summarization, which are often not great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Phil5991, do you think the other dragons have tried thwarting Gold Rush because of the threat he poses to them? Yes, I yeah. think there is beyond a doubt that there are... It actually explicitly mentions in Gold Rush's tale that many people have tried to kill him. A lot of yeah. great heroes have tried to kill him, and you could argue there are probably a number of dragons that have tried to kill him. Everyone has failed, but they've tried. Mm-hmm. Uh, like he yeah. talks about all of his various layers are literally littered with the bones of heroes. So yeah, um, th his current layer, wherever it be, is literally filled with not just the score, but the centuries of folk that have tried to bring him down and failed. In many respects, you could argue that Gal Rauch is a great limiter on the heroes of the old world or wherever else it happens to be. In that, those that reach the power where they might be able to take out Gal Rauch are killed by Gal Rauch meaning that Gal Rauch is basically ensuring that the world never achieves another Sigmar. Yep, um, yep. Laughing God, Abarash with the Drakwald Runefang versus Gal Rauch. Gal Rauch would, be, that would be That would be a pretty fucking awesome fight. Yeah. Um, and Gal, yeah, yeah, that would, that would be <laughs> very, very hard for Gal Rauch, I think. That would be an epic, epic battle. And that's what you're looking for with these things. The vast majority will just die. But yeah, then something like this comes up. I want to say this is a joke, but one of the things I actually want to lean into here is this is one of the beauties of Warhammer, if you're telling the stories properly, is that the forces of order are often very ill-equipped. They need to open up yeah. their minds and be able to side with uh, people they might normally consider enemies. The idea of teaming up with Aberash and giving him one of the sacred rune fangs would be seen as one of the ultimate heresies. But if you're trying to kill Galrach, that's one of the actually good ideas to bring him down. And Aberash is a character who would be willing to do that based on yeah. his characterizations. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And indeed, uh, if, if one were to write the end times, this is a fight that should be had and Aberash should win and fall because of it. Um, mm. This is the sort of stuff that should have happened in the end times. The big what if fights should have happened. Not, well, we don't really have anything here. We'll create a new character for this bit. We'll do a bit over here. We'll have an epic fight by this town that no one's ever heard of. We'll go and do this. But no, none of that really matters. What matters is concluding all the tales of the Warhammer world and yeah. concluding the tale of Galrauch. This would be a fine way to conclude it, particularly if it also ends with Abarash falling as he attempts to drink all of that blood out. Oh, that'd be a mess. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would, oh, be, that would be beautiful. Uh, yeah. Just actually beautiful as an end for both Abarash and Gal Rauch in its current form. I could even see Gal Rauch, um, if you really want to make it work really well, have Gal Rauch the dragon within 
be the one that basically flings its head back and lets Aberash win in the same way that previously the <laughs> demon had lit, flung its head back and let Galrauch eat it. It would be the perfect that conclusion to that story. So what you're doing when you're trying to build stories is do that sort of stuff. Let Galrauch um, do to the demon what was done to it. That's just beautiful in terms of a lovely resolution to the story. I'm not saying it's the best one. You could probably think up of another one. Literally just made this one off the top of my head as we're discussing it right now. But that's what I found that the end times completely failed at doing. It was attempting to tell a new story rather than conclude the existing yeah. stories. Remember, guys, if you're telling an apocalypse story, don't invent any new characters. Mm. <laughs> you don't need end. to. Yeah. It's the end. Yeah. yeah. Uh Luigi, so why is the reason is so is the reason why souls in the realm of more seem to become somber and less vibrant is that they are adapting to an immaterial environment. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really blunt and empty answer. Right, I won't go into any depth of this because we're not discussing the realm of more, obviously. And we could easily discuss the realm of more for some time because yeah. it's such an amorphous subject that Ooh, has been yeah. so so uh, wobbly written by various writers over time but is the reason this the answer is absolutely not the realm yep. of war is not like this because of uh, various souls attempting to adapt to the immaterial environment they're in yep um count commander ben count mordrick would take on galrach totally that poor collection of tentacles and a piece of armor oh count mordrick Count Mordrick is, for me, a character that always amuses me because it's so clearly based upon a Michael Moorcock character that it's almost hilarious. Um, and uh, I love Count Mordrick because of that. But, uh, it, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think Mordrick's going to win that one. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> as much uh, as I, I, I love you, Commander Bond, I'm pretty sure that Mordrick will be damned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, he probably wouldn't even manage to get himself killed because he's Mordrek and he just his life just sucks. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, OMG4040, love your streams, guys. Got me into playing Warhammer Fantasy, uh, got me into Warhammer Fantasy Lord listening to this while playing some uh, Total War Warhammer. Keep it up, Excellent. appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, enormously yeah. appreciated. Uh, Sam Alden, who is the lead, who is in the lead for creating the most horrible monster slash experiments in the world, Galrach or Melchior on a particularly bad day, <laughs> or is it? Throughout the unclean, or is Galrush. it? Uh, yeah, Gal, it's probably Gal Rush. <laughs> he's been around um, the longest. Uh, yeah, he's been around pretty much. Uh, you could argue that he's only been doing it for the last while until you look at things like, say, Chimeras and go, well, they've been around pretty much forever, haven't they? Is that his him? If it was, then the answer is Gal Rouch. It's like um, Chimera showed up after the Cataclysm, and uh, and Gal Rouch was created during the Cataclysm. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you've also got to remember that characters like, say, Melchior or indeed the Skaven or whatever, they tend to be relatively focused in their studies in that they are only creating creatures of a particular type, where I think Gal Rouch is almost certainly responsible for anything that it can possibly figure out. And it's got a pretty big brain. My my joke answer to your question would actually be Goros Warhoof, the sire of a thousand young because canonically, he literally bones anything that moves, and it somehow produces children that are horrific monsters. I don't know how that works, but it does. <laughs> Goros has got some, he's got some interesting all, things going on. <laughs> all fields are fertile. Yeah. He, he's, got, he's got quite the superpower. <laughs> um. T ball 31, you said the dirt through stream that he comes out even against basically anything in Warhammer. Would he beat or come out even with Galrach? Dirt through versus Galrach would be the textbook definition of a kaiju battle. Yeah, it would. Um, and I think it would be super fascinating. Um, uh, I think that I think Galrach is not stupid enough to bother trying. It's not what it's yeah. there to do. Um, the only reason to do that would be in an end time situation, an end time scenario, and that is where you have your epic kaiju battle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I would say they are on relatively even footing uh, is a reasonable way to put it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Jonathan Scott, future idea, Galrach versus uh, Kolek, Kaiju fight. Obviously, I yeah. take this as a joke comment, but I will say there is actually something to this if you wanted to have fun with some stories where yeah. Kolek is a dragon ogre of the oldest type. He is a Shaggoth. This mm -hmm. is a character who hates dragons. He would not tolerate Galrach at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I like this one. 
Yeah, so there is actually some pretty, like, whenever you're dealing with, like, oh, where's the best ways to have chaos infighting? This is a perfect example of chaos infighting, where Kolek would take huge issue with Galrach as an entity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. I I'm, I'm, I'm agreed, is what I say to that. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, Joe Miller, hey, lads, I was wondering something. Apologies if I've already asked. I'm about an hour behind. But could Galrach ever beat the possession? Sadly, I don't think so. I think that's... It's the fact that he's even able to hang on is such an extraordinary, impossible act of will that it's it's bonkers. Like it yeah. literally any other character in this scenario, their soul would have been completely like devoured. Yeah, I mean, at its simplest, um, there was a trap set up, and that trap was uh attacking Galroach at the weakest possible point. And if it succeeded, the greater demon has won. And it succeeded. It attacked at the dragon's weakest point, the most powerful dragon left alive in the world, and got it. And that is that is fundamental. It's stuck now. This is its new existence. Its only way out is going to be self-destruction. And the only way it can stop what is happening to it is that. And that is also manifested in the rules quite literally what Galrauch attempts to do whenever it gains control, kill itself. So I think sadly the answer to this is no, it's never happening. Yeah. And if so it was if it, it was a, if it was a story not in the Warhammer world, maybe. But in the Warhammer world, no. Yeah. Um, agreed. Yeah. I will say I do want to give a call out uh to everyone in chat that says skull every time Andy brings up Michael Moorcock. <laughs> I'm going to need to start doing these streams with my own drink so I can do it myself and join you. <laughs> <laughs> Get myself some Jack Daniels and Nick each time I go. <laughs> oh, man. Hammond asking the really important questions. Why isn't Charizard a dragon type? He's only fire flying uh, because Ooh. Japan wanted the dragon type to be unique. So they only wanted one of the original 151 to have it. That's the genuine answer, uh, as silly as it is. Um, but but it's silly. It is silly. Uh, it is but, silly. At least one of his mega evolutions uh, uh, has dragon type. So there's that. Charizard X. Gotta love him. All right. Cody Smith. Can a demon only have aspirations in the material world where time and space mean something? Do demonic entities only reproduce in the material world? Okay. That's um, two questions which um, are difficult to answer in a variety of different ways. But first, let's take each one in turn from my perspective. Can a demon only have aspirations in the material world where time and space mean something. No. And that's because demons are... Hmm. So, this is hard to sum up in a pithy phrase, um, but yeah. demons are manifest will in a particular direction, which will involve aspiration at points, as in end goal material that they're going for. Now, you might go, how does that make sense? With no time, I'll give you a way of making it make sense. Um, I can only exist when X happens. So their goal is to make X happen so they can exist. But then you go, but how could they be fighting for their own existence? Because there is no time in the Aether. They will exist at some point. They don't exist yet. So their entire aspiration, so to speak, would be getting into the material realm to make an event occur so that they exist. That would be a weird way of making an aspirational demon. Um, do demonic entities only reproduce in the material realm? Do they reproduce at all under normal circumstances is the first question. The answer is yes. Take a look at plague bearers. We know that they reproduce through the material world, but that's not the only way they necessarily create plague bearers. Mm -hmm. Is it the only way that they reproduce, as in get more of them? The answer is clearly and objectively no, in that there are a variety of etheric entities that have been born in the Aether and never come out of the Aether, they are in the Aether, which means that do demonic entities only reproduce in the material world? No. Yeah, and there's there's even examples of demons creating other demons that are kind of like what you would kind of view as their children, though it doesn't work. It's a mind fuck is really the easiest way to put it, but the general answer is no. There are There are ways to do it. Absolutely. So thanks for the question there, Cody, because um, they they are surprisingly deep, but fortunately they have relatively clean answers. So I've gone for the short and simple answers rather than go, let's have a big discussion about what demons are. I think that will be a stream in and of itself. <laughs> Garach uses flamethrower. It's super effective. I mean, it would be. 
I mean, his his flame breath is really fucking strong. <laughs> oh, yes. Really uh, and then uh, <laughs> Darthu tries to block. It's not a fact. I mean, fire, <laughs> is definitely, fire is definitely something Darthu doesn't want to deal with. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think so, I think that's a, a clean way of looking at how Durthu would face off against the dragon. Um, it would be difficult. Yeah, it would be difficult. Yeah. Uh, Phil, fifty nine ninety one. Doesn't demonic possession always eventually kill the host? Are dragons fundamentally immortal? Right. So this is something that we discussed earlier in the stream, where demonic possession always kills the host. But are dragons fundamentally immortal? And I think that the word <laughs> immortal here is the problem. Um, the word immortal has been used even by games workshop in multiple different ways whether you have the immortal you cannot be killed version or the immortal you will never die of old age version or the immortal you'll just keep on going regardless option so by one definition of the world dragons are effectively particularly when they're old immortal particularly the big original ones they just keep yeah. going but are they immortal Nah, it's a completely different kettle of fish, and clearly no, many of them have died in a variety of ways. And equally, um, I think the more important question here is not so much, are they immortal? It's how resistant are they to chaos? That's the big one. Because if you're in a host that is entirely resistant to chaos, yet you've managed to possess it, that host is never going to properly corrupt and die. And that's ultimately what's happening here. The dragon is possessed. It's an extreme exceedingly powerful one and it's not properly corrupting and dying at all it just keeps on going and it still has all of the needs wants and requirements of a dragon so it's still eating it's still sleeping one of the stories clearly mentions that when he wakes up he's starving actually starving because he's been sleeping for so long meaning that the dragon pops out and goes off looking for food which is about as low on the chain of greater demon needs as you can possibly match yet hmm. this is this is the first thing that it does it doesn't go off and scheme it doesn't sit down and say right now today i'm going to do this it goes off and it does material stuff and the greater demon is entirely bound up within the entity that it's in and that entity is as as loose as the language is here fundamentally immortal yeah, and it's also worth noting that you, if you wanted to kind of have some fun investigation with it, there is a lot to suggest that the possession that this Lord of Change used was a very unique form of yeah. possession because the whole incident is very different than normally what happens. It was not a spiritual corruption. It was more like a physical corruption, first and foremost, that went inwards. Um, so there, there's a lot to kind of consider there. But like Andy said, uh, when you're dealing with the dragon, I mean, you're dealing, kind of think of it like in our world, right? There's a there's a law in our world when it comes to dealing with cancer, where when creatures get to a certain size, they're fundamentally immune to cancer because the cancer just can't get large enough before the body's defense mechanisms are able to deal with it. So like elephants, they just can't get it. They cannot get a cancer that will kill them, unlike us, um, because we're small enough where that could become a genuine problem. So I like that as an analogy. That's a good yeah. one. So yeah, dragons nice kind of fall into a similar category. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you could see potentially a, a similar thing with maybe an entity like a giant, for instance. They're just so big that they can withstand a lot more punishment. Mm, that's interesting. I like that as an analogy. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it's time to get into questions. It isn't because Grease's school tooth has just dropped in. Son of a bitch. Uh <laughs> I like, and I, I like your new profile pic, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I love to see a scene where Galrach and Kolak argue and nobody knows what they're talking about because their beef predates the old ones. Well, I mean, you have to keep in mind, it wouldn't mm. be the dragon Galrach that Kolak would be arguing with. Uh, it would be the Lord of Change. If anything, mm. you'd actually probably see a situation of the Lord of Change trying to convince Kolak why they should work together or why yeah. Kolak shouldn't try to kill him because he's not really a dragon. He's serving the same thing. And Kolak being like... I don't actually serve the gods. We made a deal. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kill you, uh, which is yeah. what would make the dynamic so fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we got one more in here from Hunter. What is the Mardag? Is it a demon of corn? Yeah, well, it's originally a demon that was popped up in um, as a, it wasn't even a demon of corn, but there was a demon of death. 
Um, and it was an incarnate element, if you want to know it, for what it actually was, I suppose, the, the Mardag and the Viadag that were presented in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. There have been various attempts to rewrite them to match lores at various editions, um, where they generally go for the incarnate elemental of, rather than saying that it's a greater demon of instead. Um, so in that case, it's much more likely to be viewed as a as a, an entity of Shyish than it is to be a demon of corn, in my view. Yep. All right. So, uh, question times. Uh, so question ask, time. Can Galrach beat Grombrindel? I don't know. That would literally be a battle of demigods. Um, so, there's a, what Grombrindel even is, is kind of a hard question to answer. We'll talk about that next week. Um, the answer is yes by 1%. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, once again, if you ask questions, but we already answered it, I am going to skip it just to um, uh, make things move smoother. So don't be like, oh, he's got my question because he hates me. We already talked about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip over him. I mean, he says that, but I reckon it's more the hate thing. <laughs> I hate you people. Uh, let's see. <laughs> How could you not know what we were going to say in advance? Uh, let's see. What do you think would happen if Galrosh and Baldros met? Uh, well, they probably have met because Galrosh likely created him. Um, but Baldros doesn't seem like the most sane entity. Um, he seems like he's kind of one of those creatures that's gone completely mad due to his change. So I don't think there would be much of a discussion. Um, oh, here's a, here's a, have the Asser ever attempted to put Galrosh down? Yes, absolutely they have. And they have yeah, failed. multiple times. And they have failed every single last time as well. And that is the ultimately probably the story I think I would quite like to tell with the end times as well. Because that's really where the story began. And it's really where the story probably should end. Yeah, if I was actually going to put a character up against Galrosh in the end times to try and tell a tragic but fitting uh, end theme... I would probably have Imbric and his dragon uh, go up against Galrach because then you have this what an elf and dragon used to represent and what Galrach used to be going up against what he's become. Be a good way to kill Imric. Yes, I, I agree. Um, yeah, good way to kill Imric. Yep. Uh, let's see. If the demon was removed from Galrach, would he be able to live? No, he'd probably die. Uh, yeah. And if he didn't, he would want to. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there is no if here. The demon can't be removed. Uh, it is what it is now. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Until what... someone writes an alternative, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what would Galrosh do for a Klondike bar? Uh, it would be part of one of his grand and horrible schemes that would come to fruition with him getting a sweet, savory treat. There we go. Oh, uh, sweet, savory treat. <laughs> Maharaja of End. Is he a figurative father or a literal father? He's both. Yeah, both. Yeah. Uh, would I implement? Uh, let's see. We already answered that. I would make him a legendary hero. I think it fits better. Uh, mm -hmm. Is Galrush related in any way to the Cathayan dragons? New. No. He's an Ulthwani dragon. Uh, so he's a Western Drake. Western dragon. Um, Malasar. So for real, who is the true father of dragons? There is no canonical answer for this because there are different interpretations. And it's uh, almost certainly going to be overwritten again. Yeah. It's probably going to be some brand new ass bullshit dragon they pull out of their butt. Yeah. Um, probably. And who suddenly wakes up and they get to drop down and give them stats of seven instead of six. <laughs> <laughs> Dies to single cannonball. Wow, what a threat. Bloody <laughs> hell, what a threat that was. Yeah. Um, Dawi asks, is Galrush more Zinchian in nature or has become more pure chaos? He's explicitly Zinchian. Zinch. Because he is a lord of change. Yep. Um, I mean, when we think of, when we say Galrush, I actually think it's a complete misnomer. Galrush is the dragon um, and the spirit that lies within the uh, entity that we're referring to here as Galrouch is, in fact, the greater demon of Zinch. So you're saying we should call him Fake Claw? <laughs> God damn it! No! <laughs> Freaking Fake Claw. I, I can barely bring myself to say You, you can tell there was somebody sitting at the keyboard writing the 7th edition book and he's like, oh shit, this thing should probably have a name. Uh, fate. Uh, <laughs> you dragons, we make dragons of claws. Yeah, uh, yeah but it's a great demon of Zinch. It has talons. Great demons of Zinch have talons. Oh no. Oh, no. Uh, super funny. All right, Akuma King. Um, yeah, no, no, no. We already answered all these. Could oh, could the Cathayan Emperor purify Galrach? That is a genuinely interesting question because of what we talked about with the Celestial Dragon Emperor apparently being able to do that to certain creatures. So maybe um, I'd say probably I not. 
Yeah. Um, uh, I'd say probably not. I think that the fundamental nature of what happened to that dragon is beyond anything as it currently stands. There is only one way to get out of it, and that's for the dragon to die. And I think to undermine that would be to... I mean, undermine the whole story. Yeah, it ruins um, the story, to be frank. It does, it ruins the story. To give him a get-out-of-jail-free card just because there's a dragon out there that does some cleansy stuff every once in a while. It feels like it would make a great story to have an attempt go ahead and completely fail. That would be a good story. But having a good story, having a story where that succeeded, it would need to be a really good story not to have you just go, really? That's yeah. what you chose? And I, I would also argue that Shen Yang could not do it. He was able to do it for creatures that had chaos in them, like they had been mutated and they had like a fair amount of chaos corruption in them. But that's very different from an entire greater demon possessing your entire mortal form. Yeah, um, it's totally. it's very different degrees of severity. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, Behemoth's boy, since Games Workshop has a history of borrowing ideas from Middle Earth, are there any similarities between Galrach and Glaurung, the father of Middle Earth's dragons? I don't think that's that big of a stretch. I mean, uh, is there any similarities between <laughs> anything in Middle Earth um, and the various Lord of the Rings lore and Warhammer stuff? Yeah. I mean, particularly when you take a look at just naming practices alone. They're quite clearly influencing each other very strongly to the point that you're almost like, this is just really bad Middle Earth fanfic um, uh, with, with minced up names that don't understand the linguistic roots of the names that were chosen by Tolkien and have just taken similar sounds and gone, yeah, that's what we're doing. So the influence, yes. However, they have become their own thing over time. Yeah, that you know, that's why I actually tend to like Draugnir as the father of the dragons in the West more than Calgalanos, because Calgalanos is literally just Ancalagon the Black. Like he's yeah, literally the exact thing. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, let's see. What kind of meals could ogres make from Galrach? Probably nothing that would not mutate the living shit out of them. It's the greater demon is each did all die. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be bad. It would be bad. Really would be kind of hilarious, though. I'm not going to lie. But, I agree. Uh, yeah, it would, it would probably be a bit of a rough, <laughs> rough time. I mean, that's going to give you some wind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, back, sometimes ogres, uh, ogres are pretty good about taking mutation in stride, so you never know. Uh, Jaunty yeah, Scarecrow, how do regular dragons feel about Chaos Dragons in particular? Um, depends on the type of dragon. If you're talking about, like, Ulthwani dragons, they probably see them just flat out as abominations. Um, if you're talking about some of the old world dragons, it depends. Old world dragons are a lot more malicious. They're very intelligent, but they tend. I call and that could be because they're actually descendants of them. Yeah, it could because, be. You know, they're not all twisted weirdos. Just a good chunk of them are. Yeah, and but there are some dragons that don't really give a shit about the difference between chaos and not chaos. They are like, I've got me and fuck everyone else. Um, so they probably would just see them like other dragons and not really care. I mean, take a look at what um, uh, good old Galrak did to the Great Chaos Horde. He ate it all. Um, so it's not like it's not like he hasn't done some good things. Yeah, yeah true. Uh, Ryan Lich, what is the general opinion of Galrach by the other notable Chaos Line characters? Uh, to stay the You're... fuck away from him, generally. <laughs> I mean, um, I would be pretty goddamn scared of it, even if I was a kick-ass motherfucker. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 ancient in a way that none of them can comprehend. Yeah, Galrach is very explicitly a character that all other Chaos characters avoid. Just, I mean, see what's happened to Sigvald, right? Sigvald yeah. nearly fucking died, despite the fact that he was already at that point insanely powerful. Galrach... I mean, you're not just dealing with a dragon. You're dealing with a greater demon of Zinch. Dragons already can be exceedingly powerful magic users and intelligent and exceedingly hard. But add on top of that the cunning awfulness of a greater demon of Zinch plus all its extra magic? Yeah, screw that. Yeah, and it's worth it's worth saying a lot of people tend to get into their idea that there's like, oh, I'm chaos, you're chaos, we're on the same team. That is virtually never how it works. Um, mm -hmm. ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, chaos people all fucking hate each other because they're all in each other's way. Um, they they don't get along generally speaking. Um, and if they do get along, it's usually because they're using one another to accomplish some kind of goal. 
But Galrach is even fucking scarier because A, it's a Lord of Change, which are duplicitous as fuck. And B, at any moment, Galrach could theoretically wake up and decide that he's back on team good and just massacre everyone in the room. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um... Uh, let's see. What do the Cathayan dragons think of Galrach? I mean, they would probably see him as a big nope. abomination. They're very anti-chaos, mm-hmm. and he is like the most chaosy dragon in existence. Yep. Big hard nope to that thing. Uh, who would be the mother of chaos dragons? Don't know. We don't know, and I, I, I would like to make an argument that it would also be Galrach. Yeah, I mean, what we talked about earlier. There's a lot yeah. of strengths to suggest that Galrach could be able to asexually reproduce, yeah. uh, especially because he's literally able to mutate his flesh um so he could kind of do weird things to himself as he desired um and he can Indeed, uh, given the very nature of the creatures it's almost certainly um created i would i would argue that not only is it capable of doing that that very possibly that some entities out there that we perceive as great beastman creatures or um, horrible monsters of the forest are actually reproduced from its own flesh yeah um, but uh, that being said, there are probably some mother dragons, but Ga- I will note Gay's workshop had a really annoying obsession with only doing fathers of various species or entities. They did for a while. You like never ever saw the mother of whatever, even though that's a really well established trope if you're looking back at like Greek and Roman mythology. Massively so. Uh, yeah, it used to bug me no way. Uh, GW really just did didn't do that for the longest fucking time. Mm-hmm. Uh, considering Galrach was an elven mount, was he an Ulthwani dragon or more like an old world dragon? No, he was explicitly an Ulthwani dragon. Yep, Ulthwani. Uh, <laughs> this question makes me laugh from Jiggy. Did the old ones just only pick the pretty dragons to go to Ulthwan and tell all the ugly dragons they had to stay behind in the old world? Maybe. Maybe. It's a, that's a <laughs> funny question, but you, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the whole one's just being like, ah, no, you're too hideous. You, you have to stay home. Only the pretty dragons get to go to our uh, special magical floating island. Um, all right. Does Galrach still father whelps after Grokroi cast? Oh, yeah, explicitly. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does the Winds of Magic react about Galrach? A lot. He's a wizard. <laughs> yeah. He's a great team to Zinch. He's pretty much generating them. Shadow Ranger 02, where would I get started if I want to read about Galrach? White Dwarf 272. 274. 274? Right, 274. 274. I think 274. it's 274. Yes, you're right. 274. Uh, 274. Uh, also, any uh, either the Hordes of Chaos book from 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy tabletop or the 7th mm-hmm. or 8th edition Warrior of Chaos books. Yeah, basically 6th edition well, onwards, it, you'll find lots of mentions. And the 8th edition book, the, the, it pops up a couple of times in the timeline and has a nice little section dedicated yeah, to it. Yeah, well. the the eighth edition is virtually identical to the seventh edition, and the seventh is. edition is mostly identical to six. Uh, and seventh the sixth edition, edition is basically the white dwarf article with some bits cut out of it. Yeah. So if you really wanted to get like the whole story, I would literally just read white dwarf six, seventh, and then you're done. Yeah. Um, because seventh added the timeline stuff. It did. Uh, see, so Jump oh. Scarecrow. Um, hmm. Uh, how did the Lord of Changes' possession of Galrach differ from Bellacor's attempts to possess mortal bodies, and why was his permanent without destroying it? I think we covered that pretty heavily, of yeah. that it's a matter of scale and resistance. Bellacor had an obsession with trying to possess humans, because he wanted to possess an ever-chosen, Yep. Um, which is what kept getting him into trouble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um... Let's see. Techies, I'm glad you like Alrach. That's a subjective question, but I'm glad you like him. Um, Acolyte to Gash, I feel like we answered that pretty well, but uh, the answer is maybe. Uh, potato Salad, uh, we already talked about the female Chaos Dragons, potentially. Filefoot, talking about fish people. Funny you mentioned fish people, though. When I was doing research for this episode and reading through the 7th edition book, I didn't realize there's actually a fish people fact that I had missed in that book. Is there? Uh, Where? Yeah, Ooh! So- timeline there's a story that talks about a chaos fleet is sailing the ocean and a pyramid comes up from under the water and like in the middle of their fleet and a giant army of fishmen attacks them from this floating pyramid i was like what i was like what the fuck how did i miss this um so god damn it that's annoying i can't believe i missed that one there's a sunken pyramid full of fish people that can apparently breach the surface and attack 
uh, people. Uh, the war, I got the fishman lore. Yeah. So uh, apparently the forces of chaos win, but like what? All right. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, let's see. How often do chaos dragons give themselves over willingly versus being slowly corrupted while they sleep? I don't know if I've ever heard of a single dragon that got corrupted by choice. Yeah, me neither. Um, and I imagine you could probably tell a good tale about that if you wished, but it's not one that I'm aware of. Yeah, Sir Pennington, and the new Old War lore, it implies that the Dragon Emperor was the strongest, being pre-old ones. Uh, that said, how close do you think the gap is between him and post-corruption Galrach? I imagine the Celestial Dragon Emperor, because there are some very specific shenanigans that are going on with him, is more powerful than Galrach, but it would be more of a fight than you may initially suspect. Because Galrach is so much stronger than he's given credit for. Um, yeah. Him versus Shen Yang would be like probably the biggest possible dragon fight that could happen in the modern age. Super fun, though. Oh, yeah, it would be super fun. There'd be a lot more. It would be much more about spell casting than probably anyone would initially suspect. It would mm. probably be much less of a physical battle than you would think. Um, is Zinch the only one with dragons? No. Um, it's, it's very explicitly mentioned that although the, even the split head chaos dragons, which are often seen as Zinch dragons, they are, they are descendants of Galrach and have a Zinchian flair, but they could be dedicated to any of the great powers. And a lot of them are undivided, but you could have like a chaos dragon of Slanesh or a chaos dragon of corn or Nurgle or whatever. They, mm -hmm. they might have the two heads. They might have a completely unique design. Um, that's totally viable. I mean, uh, Skolex, uh, not Skolex, um, Scradrock, I think, is explicitly a Cornate Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, can Embrick use his special powers to interact with Chaos Dragons or Toad Dragons? Not Toad Dragons, because they're not dragons. They are called dragons. They are explicitly not. They're just big, fat reptiles. They are more akin to the dinosaurs of Lustria than they are to dragons. Um, Chaos Dragons, though, he could. Um, there would be a really interesting thing to explore there. Emric is said to know how to use the dragon song to very dramatic effect to the point where that he literally had a tabletop rule where dragons could not attack him in close combat. So, uh, he, yeah, he could interact with chaos dragons though. Uh, there would be stories to tell there. That would be interesting. Um, why do most dragons not lead any factions at all now? Because most dragons do not give a shit about mortals and don't want to deal with them. The Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress, who's technically not a dragon anyway, are very unique in that regard. Like, why? if you think about it, would you want to lead a civilization of ants? You theoretically could. You're powerful enough to do it. But you look at them and go, God, they're so boring. And, like, they don't live very long. And I can't talk to them very well. Like, this is stupid. Um, mm -hmm. That is probably how a dragon would feel about leading mortals. Yep. Uh... <laughs> Uh, oh, I like this is a cool question. It's not technically it's kind of related, but I do like the question, Andy. Uh, let me know what you think about this. Um, do you think going forward in the lore that the idea that the high elf moon dragons could have any kind of relationship to the moon empress could be explored as a possibility? Yes. There you go. Um, I think why it was super fun that we start tying the lore together um, with nice neat bows, which currently is not the case. There's lots of discrete lore, which looks like it should be tied together. And we've discussed this in previous threads as well, concerning Moonfire and various other representations mm -hmm. of how <clears throat> we could tie that all together. So yeah, go check our previous streams. We've discussed this to a degree at some length. Yep. Um, why are Toe Dragons called dragons? Because humans named like them. Th because humans named them, yeah, totally. Um, humans are constantly naming things that have got similar qualities as, you know, like a dragon turtle. Dragon turtle is Warhammer as well. It's not really a dragon, but it does breathe fire, and it, it's a turtle with a big long neck. Yeah, ge generally the way humans work is if it's large and it's a reptile, they're going to call it a dragon, <laughs> even mm -hmm. though it's just not. True fact. Um, uh, let's see. How would Galrach and the other Chaos Dragons react to each other? Um... Um, Galrach, um, would, uh, as has already been marked in the lore, he will test them to see if they're worthy. And that means he will be eating some of them. And those that are useful will almost certainly be put to use. Yeah. And dragons dragons tend to be very territorial creatures that often do mm -hmm. not like sharing space. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. We've talked about that. What are some other methods to create chaos dragons? Um, lots of different ways. They could be sleeping on a... Strength. 
like it could be spells are cast on them or demons are involved or they're sleeping and a chaos cultist finds them and casts a big ritual or they could be sleeping on top of a powerful artifact or they could eat something that's particularly bad it just depends yeah how long is a piece of string there's gonna be as many answers to that as there is chaos entities out there <laughs> attempting to bring them under heel snow sif andy i beg you could you describe galrach in a w wolfrop stat block um could i yes Will I off the top of my head? No. Um, I, I would like to sit down and have a good think before I do that. I'm currently um, uh, arguing with myself concerning some uh, old elf characters that I'm statting in the background and exactly how silly I want to go with them. And uh, I'm, I'm changing the XP rules a little bit to explain the numbers that I'm hitting at because the XP rules in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay have an upper limit and they shouldn't. Um, the upper limit was only put in space because of scale, because of space limitations, um, and and because I didn't like the bloody way it had been done anyway. I didn't argue too much about how it was getting changed. Um, so uh, I am making a change to that so that I can handle my top tier elves in a way that seems a bit better. Once I have that in place, it'll be much easier to then, in turn, handle something like a ridiculous dragon. There you go. Uh, just put just put a uh, one thousand in every characteristic for now. <laughs> no, no six. Yeah, six. Six six hundred. <laughs> no, six. just six. Just, just, six. just six. Just six. Weapon skill six. Someone Weapon sneezes skill. on him and he dies. Weapon uh, skill zero if you go with the early version, or six if you go with eight. <laughs> Uh, well, he threw you know, right, this is a small thing. What really bugged me was the change of its leadership to nine in eighth edition. Holy I know, shit. It's so At least silly. ten previously made sense. Nine? Get out of it. Yeah, this breath Washington attack got down. better, but his stat line got worse. They also got rid of his ward save, which was super dumb. Yeah. Uh, he, had, oh, okay. he, he, had a, he had a five up ward save back in six, and they got rid of that, which was stupid. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Sigvald. Uh, oh, can you tell us more about the song that Sigvald sung to Galrosh to make him go crazy? Um, was it the dragon song? No, it's it, no. It, the story actually tells you what it is. If you go back to the scene where the elf is singing it, it is a lament. I want to say it's a lament Lem about like the tragedy that Ulthuan has suffered. Um, but it's it's not the dragon song. It's it's a, yeah. like an actual regular song. Yeah, it's it's basically a funeral song. Um, a, a lament. Yeah. Um, what interactions does Galrosh have with other characters? Very very few. Um. He uh, explicitly, he's interacted with Sigvald, and that's about it. Yeah, so we have nothing written in the lore at all, but I think it's very likely that there has been a significant amount of interaction between it and other entities down through the course of the very many years. But do realize that this thing is quite above and beyond anything else. Um, so any interactions are not going to be, let's have a nice, just handy discussion about something. It's going to be orders. It's going to be, um, this is how things are going to happen and nothing else. Yeah. But uh, if you've been enjoying the stream, you will have heard that me and Andy could both easily argue that there's a strong potential for him to have been, been involved with like the Egrim von Horseman story or with, the, or with one of the, or with some of the Cathayan children stories. I think it's particularly likely that he was responsible for Egrim's fall. Yeah. Uh, Omega Z, what kind of story would you tell using Galrat as a major character? I mean, I think you could tell a really fun story about just like each time he wakes up following a narrative that he does in every age um, where he participates. Um, but uh, like any of those stories we've talked about would be super fun. I think um, a series of linked uh, short stories with an overarching, uh, with a plot overarching the whole lot that concludes with yeah, the last that one great. would be super fun. You get a really yeah. nice novel out of that. Rat 119. Uh, do we know anything about the other dragons that... Oh, how other dragons feel about his fall. Any other dragons from Ulthuan in particular who knew him would probably see it as a horrific tragedy. Like, just a really, really awful tragedy. I bet there's probably a ton of <clears> songs <throat> in Ulthuan and Nagaroth and maybe even Athel Lauren about Galrach and his fall that are probably really, really sad fucking songs. I'm also going to interrupt there and say that we're nearing time. So if you've got any other super chats that you want to drop in, drop them in now so that we can get them to them before the end of the stream. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, last couple little questions here. Uh, uh, how do I imagine 
Oh, uh, do you think he would have looked very different if he had been corrupted by a different god? I honestly don't think the other gods would have really been able to corrupt him. Um, it would nope. have been a very different thing. Um, yeah, I, I think he was. I think of all the gods, there's only one other that could have come close, and that would probably be Slanesh. But at the, where they were in time at that point, Slanesh had no chance. Zinch and Zinch only, I think. Uh, let's see. Is <laughs> is a plausible Galrach had shown with Goros Warhoof? Implausible, but well, is it possible? I guess, uh, but probably not. Uh, who's Draugnir? He's the said by the elves to be the father of dragons, so he's likely yep. the father of the Ulfwani dragons. Uh, how many dragons would have survived the age of the old ones first coming? We have no idea, there's no strict numbers out there, it's anybody's guess. Yep. Um, are there could there have been any other dragon led empires that we do not know of? Um, or maybe their lords went into well, there were said to be multiple like realms of the dragons before the old one showed up uh what happened to those realms is it because they died or they just went to sleep who knows mm -hmm. uh in age of sigmar we have cosmic dragons they're linked to the old world are they linked to the old world dragons or the two separate entities they're very separate entities uh the cosmic dragons of aos are said to have kind of always been there or at least have been there for like unspeakable ages it's they might have slight relations to some of the old world dragons but they are not truly physical beings they are literally um entities of azurite stuff mm, yeah they're they're living constellations so they're not flesh and blood in a typical sense um if in the imperial zoo of altdorf there's a dragon or so i've heard how the hell does the empire manage it no the lord does not agree with itself on that so I have a short story that I wrote about that ages ago. I'm, I'm still considering posting that, but it doesn't make a great deal of sense outside of the context of the world that I was writing at the time, so it doesn't really help. But um, in my version, it was um, an ancient dragon that was that lived in caverns beneath where, what is now Altdorf since the time of the elves, and the elves um, left far too swiftly and the dragon was sleeping, so it had to be left behind. Um, so it was an ancient um, elven and a red dragon at that um, and as to how that turns into what becomes the later imperial dragon that was covered in the said story um, but yeah th there's lots of different ways it could be answered that would be one way yeah I think I think the most modern story I read in either 8th or 7th edition is like some random guys found an egg in like the middle like the Grey yeah. Mountains or something and we're like yeah. look dragon egg which like opens so many questions yeah I but, was like uh, yeah I'm not having that <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's a bullshit story. Yeah. Uh, if you want it to be like a big imperial dragon, it's got to have big imperial roots. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. Yeah, the the thing is is that the imperial dragon when you read its actual profile is always implied to be incredibly ancient, but then most of the stories because they're like, "Oh shit, how the fuck do I fit that in a zoo?" They try and make it a younger dragon, so there's like a yep. huge conflict every in time massively conflict. Um Yeah, the, the emperor dragon is proper powerful. Uh, we know the winds of magic are attracted to certain things. Would a wizard major sorcerer be able to find a slumbering dragon because magic is attached to them? If so, could you create a dragon connected to the winds? So, uh, okay, so dragon, there are dragons innately connected to each of the winds of magic. Um, yes. The Storm of Chaos book goes super out of its way to literally tell you about a dragon that's related to almost every single wind. Um, they even have their own classifications and physical traits and all this other stuff. Um, dragons, very interestingly, seem to be so affiliated with magic that if they sit in a magically charged area for long enough or their eggs are in a magically charged area, it will literally change their physical properties. Yep. Um, that's how you get like forest dragons of Athel Lauren being very, very unique looking because they've literally interwoven themselves with the forest itself. Um, and they do the same thing with the winds of magic. So could a wizard use the winds to theoretically track a dragon? They could. It'd probably be really hard. But, you could use the winds to track the winds, and it might lead to a dragon. Yeah, that's a better that's way to put it. Two very different things. Yeah. Um, how do Shagas view the Chaos Dragons? Rivals. Badly. Yeah, broken uh, broken rivals, I think, is actually not a horrible way to look at it. But they would see them as something that they'd want to fight, probably. Uh, are there any cases of dragons cooperating with the old ones creation outside the Elsk there, the Chaos Warbands? Say that one more time. So are there are there examples of dragons working with other races besides elves, chaos, and Cathay? Yeah, humans. Um, the great emperor dragon alone. Um, so there's a couple of stories. I mean, most of the armies at some point or another have been able to take dragons as one of the creatures they can ride. Um, so you'll find that there's lots of 
hints at it, but there's not really stories. Well, yeah, I mean, we have Tomb King dragons now, which yeah, some of oh, them, which, point, it, man. Yeah, which explicitly states that some of them served in life as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Um, seems that, I would say the only race that does not seem to have any chance of having a friendly relationship Green with dragons, greenskins, Green and uh, dwarfs. Hey, dwarfs, no. Yeah, dwarfs do not like dragons. <laughs> Any um, more questions there? Yeah, last one. Uh, <laughs> it's a stupid question, so I'm skipping it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, moving on to the last few super chats, and then we're done. Hammond, how angry would a dwarf be with another dwarf if you said if Galrush created all the ugly bests? I'm guessing that makes your mother his daughter. Oh my god. Um, so there is a there is a dwarven tradition that's established in one of the books that I love. Um, I can't remember what it's called in Kozalid, but it's basically a shouting match between dwarves where your goal is to shout insults. So it's kind of like a rap battle. Um, but the thing that is explicitly mentioned is it takes finesse because the goal is you have to try and say insults that are mean enough to get them to react because if you react overtly, you lose the game. Mm -hmm. But you can't use an insult that's so bad that it will like cause blood. Uh, or like grudges to be written. So it's a very intricate art. This would be instant fucking grudgement. <laughs> and like people are going to die. <laughs> uh, uh, during our last episode, we had um, a, a runesmith uh, NPC that might amuse Sotek, um, who had popped up and she mm. shouted a lot. Because, yeah, dwarves sometimes resolve issues by doing exactly that. Uh, Chris is gold too. Is it possible the old ones warming the climate affects how dragon eggs develop, and that's why modern dragons yes. aren't as strong as Gorrach? Yeah, I'd say that's yes. very, I very think that's sad. very likely, and I think that there's um, a story to be told about that. But <laughs> my ants are doing their best, <laughs> yeah. It, it is a little bit like let's get our two ant colonies and put them beside each other and see which one survives. Ah, oh, screw <laughs> this, smack the whole colony, we've killed them all, screw those guys. Yeah. Uh Alexander, where is my Chaos Dragons for Zinch Faction Total War Warhammer 3? So once again, don't fall into the trap that a lot of people fall into where they think, oh, it's Galrach's Zinch and he's their father. So therefore, all Chaos Dragons are Zinch. It's yeah. not how it works. The vast majority of dragons are not aligned. Yep. Completely agreed. Um Night until can warp. Oh, warp fire dragons, which are a whole fucking thing. Yeah, warp fire dragons are a completely different thing. They're gnomon on warp stone. Um, yeah. Because, you know, hey, who doesn't want to eat raw magic? Um, which you could argue is so that they can keep themselves active outside of times of low magic. But would they be um, with a Skaven army? It seems exceedingly unlikely. The Skaven would try to dominate them, um, which would not go well for the Skaven. <laughs> I think the biggest problem would be that the Skaven would try to backstab them because that's what Skaven yeah, do. Yeah, there's... So even there's, if there was a deal, they yeah, would there's a there's a note about warfire dragons. They actually tend to be the ultimate enemies of Skaven because they exactly. both want the warp stone. Yeah. Um, so that being said, if you're looking for a way to get them into total war, theoretically, you could squeeze them in there and be like, eh, um, you know, they'd fit better in the Skaven roster than maybe any other roster because warfire dragons aren't really aligned with anybody. They no, care they're about warp stone entirely out for themselves, and that's it. And you could argue that the Warpstone have corrupted them to the point that they um, have reached the almost ultimate expression of self-interest that dragons often express. Yeah, which fun random fun fact for you about Warpfire dragons is that the southern chaos wastes are said to be infested with them because that's where most of the world's Warpstone is. Yep. And the Warpfire dragons you see outside, so in the regular world, are the babies. Uh, mm -hmm. They're the small ones that are too small, so they get forced out by the bigger dragons and come to terrorize the world that we know, which means that the actual big ones are down in the Southern Chaos Waste, which is another re reason you should never fucking go there. Fake Claw be like, you're a wizard, Glary! <laughs> Um, all right. I wonder if the other chaos gods have dumb named demons possessed dragons like Bloodfang, Rotwing, and Pleasure Tail. Yes. Uh, I hate that I could really easily see these names being canon in some authors that have done Black Library's minds. <laughs> yeah, you know, so can I. Uh what would what would Widowmaker appear to as Fate Claw and Galrach both? I don't know. That's actually a really interesting question. Uh, the idea that Widowmaker alters its form to appear as tempting as possible, but seeing as it's Kane behind it, I don't think he would want to tempt them into picking it up. Um, he seems to want to draw elves to him, not anybody else. Maybe. I don't know. 
I've never heard of anyone else seeing the Widowmaker that's not an elf. Yeah, uh, I did a story about that as well. Um, some humans saw it, uh, but I don't know either. I'd have to think on that one because I'm not sure that it would want a dragon carrying it. Yeah, that is. Uh, mm. That's a. Good I think question. there's a question. That's a good one, Hammond. I'm going to mull on that one for a bit. Uh, ooh, Galrach tempting or playing some other key role in the corruption of one of the Dragon Emperor's children, uh, Yin Ye Long, would be fun lore. Yeah, I think that yeah. would be a very good way to tell that story. And Completely help. agreed. Yeah. Uh, Commander Bone, would Amdra the Nightmare Dragon take on Galrach? That, Amdra is in a similar category. So, like, Amdra yeah. could fight Galrach, especially because Amdra is an incredibly powerful necromancer and is literally able to raise entire armies of undead on her own. Um, yeah, like for Galrach, she she would be a problem. Um, There'd be an awful lot of tearing into each other. I'm not entirely sure either would win. It would be a back back off. Yeah, I, I highly doubt they would ever even consider fighting to the death. There would be like yeah. territorial disputes, and then they both would walk away to lick their wounds. Mm -hmm. And that is the end of today's stream. Awesome. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't what I miss. No, well, you, you missed one of the um, Twitch ones. Or that, oh, there it is. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Chaos Dragon of Slanesh doing the smog thing of coating itself in gems. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think that would make quite a good, um, uh, or indeed anything that would uh, change things up a little bit. Yeah, I definitely think that would work quite well. Yeah, if you really wanted to go all in on the gem encrusted belly and all that, or like its armor is made of gold and gems that it's fused into itself, that would be awesome mm -hmm. for a Slanesh dragon. It truly would. It truly would. All right. Now we're done. I think so, we're done. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so thank you all very much for turning up this week. Um, that conversation went largely where I expected it to, but at the same point, we managed to um, plumb out a couple of details that might otherwise have been easily forgotten, like good old Karak Vlag. Um, can't miss that one. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you brought that, that up one. because yeah. they, didn't, they didn't put that in any of the army books. Yeah, totally. And I think they probably didn't put it in one of the army books because they might have decided not to do that anymore. Regardless, though, it is in print. Um, and it does slightly contradict the version that you'll find for the fall of that hold elsewhere. But I think arguably makes a far better version when you read the little details about how effectively it creates a new realm of chaos down there. You just can't help but go, bloody hells. Bloody well, yeah, hells, this like, Chaos Dragon is bad. I like that it reinforces the idea that whenever he attacks a place, he permanently fucks it up. Oh, uh, yeah. That, like, Anguin is now an Eternal Knight. Uh, mm -hmm. It also would be like, oh, he was involved in Prague. That would uh, uh, have a lot of strength there. Like, there's a lot of... And that just makes him fucking scary. Makes him super it fucking really, scary. Really, really does. Um, So, my conclusion at the end of this one is that this is a character that's often overlooked by many. Um, because it's 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 a dragon. It's a silly special card to dragon, right? What's what's the point of that? But much like some of the other cards we've discussed of late, um, I think that this one in particular stands out as one of the more interesting ones that Warhammer has to offer because it does change the standard dragon tropes that we're also used to seeing and turns this dragon into an exceedingly manipulative creator of monsters something that is so very different to what we'll find in our standard it's a dragon it burns you it's scary let's see if we can pierce it through its chest with some sort of giant iron bolt yeah no that's not going to be happening here so i love this character and it's a character that i feel that games workshop has largely forgotten about they have discussed it in multiple places with a drop here and there but they never really i mean what use did it have in the end times oh yeah he doesn't show up at all which is ridiculous given just how important it is. It's a greater demon that has been working towards that end since the beginning. So um, I would like to say that we have redressed that imbalance somewhat with our lovely discussion today. <laughs> We're here to save Warhammer one week at a time. <laughs> <laughs> one week at a time. <laughs> so thanks all. That, um, that was super good. Yep. Thank you all very much for watching. We really appreciate all the support and the super chats and everybody showing up to watch. Uh, we do. Really, we we're very excited for next week with Grombrindle because it's going to be a very, very unique character as far as how his story is told because uh, mm -hmm. he's more of a series of sagas as opposed to a continuous tale. Um, yes. So it should be very, very fun. Um, we hope you all will join us then. And uh, if you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed to the Lawhammer channel over on YouTube and following them on Twitch as well. He's almost at 10K followers on Twitch, which is actually pretty impressive how close 1K. is. 1K. Or, 1K. Or 1K? 1K, yeah, 1K, 1K, 10K, um, my mom, I'm uh, tiny. 
but yeah, also one K, which is very nice. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. You <laughs> and guys. equally, because you're watching currently over on the Lawhammer channel, do make sure that you go and subscribe over to SoTech Two. Do not miss any of our very exciting episodes. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna get out of here. Thank you, and <laughs> we'll have a later. lovely week. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.